Bradford. Tom. Hi, Nick. I had to call in because you had a caller in about about ten past the hour mm. who made a reference. You may remember. I don't know how good your memory is. Uh, who made a reference to a caller from Chelmsford who might, uh, suggested that the weather hadn't changed in Chelmsford. Oh, yes. Who might that yes. be? Yes. Yeah, in, 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 in talking about dingalings. And I don't normally like to talk about academic credentials because I like to think that words speak for themselves. But I do actually, I, I have, I've studied biochemistry at yes. undergraduate level. So I oh, probably so have you don't a great really understanding. You don't know I, anything about the subject at all? Well, I have a probably better understanding of physical science than a lot of the people that claim to. Uh, you you studied you... some science at undergraduate level, yeah. and that makes you an expert? No. Ah. But you are but disputing it... the opinion of experts? Yes. Carry on. Right. Um, well, I'll just... Right, if we can just skip one to, to what your last caller was saying about... To, to do with the insect, the massive loss of insects. Yeah, that we insect had. die off. Yeah, right. something like that's seventy that, that, eighty percent that, that, since yeah. the nineteen seventies, something like that. Yeah, so there, there, there can be no, no, there can be no realistic um, connection between that and 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 uh, fossil fuel burning or. I'm or not sure that anybody suggests that there is. I think that uh, the cause of that is mostly pesticides. Pesticides, yeah, chemical usage and yes, stuff. Yes, pollutants. Yeah. yeah, pollutants, right. And so, I mean, I, I see the whole focus upon reducing um, uh, the burning fossil fuels and carbon emissions and mm. stuff as a bit of a distraction from more important environmental issues such as pollution of waterways and use of chemicals. Can't we do both things. at the same time? Can't we save our position on the planet, the delicate uh, area that we live in as far as climate goes, the way that we've organised our lives around water and, the, and we depend on uh, the weather being as dependable as it has been, not uh, given us uh, any major surprises like six feet of snow, in the, the in the middle of the winter, which would close this country down pretty much, the lightest dusting shuts us down. But we've grown up with a certain way of um, of living, which in this country means that you know the climate is fairly reliably clement all the time. Not too cold, not too warm, just and, right. And, it, 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 and I'll just repeat what I said last week: um, uh, being a dingling as I am, yes. it does seem to be hasn't the actual climate meteorological conditions certainly here in Chelmsford yeah. have not seemed to have changed all that much right so and, there, and, therefore and global warming doesn't exist it may do but certainly any kind of any kind of any kind of strong political movement to to to, to, to why to, should it be to, political to, why is saving our place on the planet political i mean I mean, even by their their own statistics, we put who's, out about one... Whose statistics? At the UN, whatever, I don't know, st statistics somewhere, somewhere, oh, yes. somewhere mm -hmm. official. Somewhere, somewhere, some statistics, go on. Yeah, about one or two percent. Um, uh, I mean, we're, we're not a big, massive country. We don't have a lot of industry. I mean, obviously oh. a lot of what we are poor, Right, import. so you're saying that because Britain, what, if, if everybody in Britain actually changed their lifestyle, it wouldn't well, affect no, change no. planet-wide. Yeah. So let's not bother to do anything. Good plan. More or less, yeah. Right. I mean, uh, more or less. It's so if there's one person in your street and um, they didn't bother putting their rubbish in a bin and putting it out for the bin man, then if they just, like, threw their rubbish out the window, then it, it wouldn't subsume the entire street in rubbish, so they should just get a pass? Well, I think, I think they sent him back to prison, actually. But um, um, as in terms of... Um, as in terms of a single man chucking his rubbish in the general waste and not bothering to sort it out and into glass and plastic. No, I mean just throw it into the road. I mean we're not we're not talking about putting it in bins for the bin most man and people, taking it away. Most people that do, we did have a neighbour that did that. But as I say, right. I'm so you'd want to take action against them, right? So now yeah. we're getting somewhere. So you yeah, would want to get, take action against a country that is not actually doing its bit in order to save the environment, as we are relying on it. 
we rely on the fossil fuel industry. And if, if we put curbs on it, mm. right, that's going to seriously um, impair yeah. our position vis-à-vis our position. very dangerous powers. It won't, right? it won't impair our position. Powers. It would impair the fossil fuel industry's ability to make a profit. Uh, I think Shell Oil is about a third of the FTSE uh, 100 well, it total is, it isn't. Uh, profit. It well, isn't. Uh, perhaps someone could drag that up. Someone on your side could drag that up. Shell B shares their total profit, what they make to uh, the FTSE. It's a third uh, of the hundred companies well, that are part of the fossil fuel. Well, I don't yeah, know. They've, they've been lot. coining it in like bandits, the fossil fuel companies, over the past few years. So there's no doubt that they're making a lot of money. But how would that impact us badly if we stopped um, pulling oil and coal out of the ground and burning it from this moment on? Well, our pension. Uh, yeah, that's a, uh, that's uh, a uh, completely pension mis pension misunderstood. That is co totally misunderstood. Um, uh, pensions don't pensions don't flat. usually invest in stocks because they are too volatile. They they usually invest in government bonds, which are much more reliable. So your pensions will not be affected. What else have you got? Well, my understanding is the government. I mean, the government bonds are going to rely on the stability of the pound and the stability of our country, the stability of our military system, the stability of our political system. Right, um, so, well, so because things might not be <laughs> beneficial to the, those who are already spectacularly rich, then we better just keep doing what we're doing. Uh, in other words, um, just keep on on this road to hell because to do anything about it would be inconvenient. But it's not a road to hell. That's, my, that's what I'm saying. The, 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 right. the, the but you don't know what you're talking about. We've, we've already, we've our, already established that you don't know what you're talking about. You studied a bit of science at undergraduate level, Tom. More Are you kidding you, more me? More than you have. Yeah, of course more than I have, but right. not more than the IPCC or the UN I'll report on, on climate be, change. Right, if I can be a bit flippant, you know, Nick... <laughs> 95 of theologians would say that God exists, you know. 95 of climate change scientists might say that the climate change is a really big problem or we're all going you, to When you said flippant, Tom, you meant stupid. No, no, I meant um, flippant. No, no, well, you, you might have meant flippant, but what you came out with was stupid. Because you studied science at undergraduate level, you know better than the IPCC working group, which examines the physical science underpinning past, present, and future climate change. Scientists from all over the world assessing the rich body of scientific literature, contributing to an ever-strengthening understanding of how the climate system works. All of those people are wrong, and you, Tom, are right, because you haven't noticed the change in the weather in Chelmsford. Are you kidding me? Even if I'm wrong about that, there's nothing that we as a nation can do. Okay, well, let's just forget about it then. Problem solved. Painful. It really is absolutely painful. It's excruciating. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> how can you, in all seriousness, come on a radio station and say, I did a bit of science at undergraduate level, therefore what the UN are saying, the entire a body of climate scientists the whole world over they're all wrong because i haven't noticed a change in the weather in chelmsford where i live <laughs> and, and we're listening to him that that's the kind of person that we're following on this issue Because scientists once got something wrong, then we must dismiss all of them forever. You know, until you get sick, and then, of course, you're going to want to listen to scientists to make you better. But apart from them, it's just, um, I mean, it just blows my mind. How people with such little information can be so sure of themselves... Everyone's a blooming expert these days. Everyone gets to have their own facts. I blame Donald Trump. Oh, shut up! Okay, here's the UN report on climate change, released this year. 
It concludes the following. Human activities, principally through emissions of greenhouse gases, have unequivocally caused global warming. Widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere and biosphere have occurred. Continued greenhouse gas emissions will lead to increasing global warming with the best estimate of reaching 1.5 C in the near term. Every increment of global warming will intensify multiple and concurrent hazards. For any given future warming level, many climate-related risks are higher and projected long-term impacts are up to multiple times higher than currently observed. Risks and projected adverse impacts and related losses and damages from climate change escalate with every increment of global warming. And that climate change is a threat to human well-being and planetary health. There is a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. The choices and actions implemented in this decade will have impacts now and for thousands of years. That's what the UN report on climate change has said this year. So you could believe that, or you could believe a chap who opens his front door in Chelmsford and uh, concludes that there is no such thing as global warming because it's still a bit chilly out. He's done his own research. Lewisham. Hello, Jane. Hi there. Hello. You know, you were saying about the restaurants and that closing because they haven't got staff. Correct. I don't think it's that. I think it's it quite is, simply. It is that. People, it is that. people, who, are, got... people who are running restaurants are saying that that's what the problem is. No, the people haven't got the money to go to them. That is a problem, and... but it's not the problem. I think that's the most problem. People Jane, people who about... are running restaurants are saying the reason they are failing is they can't get the staff. The people who are actually running the restaurants, you'd think they'd know what they're talking about. Or maybe they're making excuses, and maybe if they did have the staff, they still wouldn't get the people uh, to no, go No, that's in not them. an excuse, though. If the reason that they're folding is that people can't afford to go there, then that is not them excusing poor management, is it? If people haven't got the money, they just can't go there. Because people even think about, well, they don't even buy a coffee when they're out now. Whereas before... People would just go and buy a coffee. Yeah, they still whenever. do. They still do. A, a, a good number do, but uh, Jane, you're just making this don't. up, aren't you? You're I'm one of these people. Yeah, of course, you are. You're just one of these people that say that I've done my own research. But what by which you mean? I've just pulled some spurious information out of the air and then made uh, made up whatever uh, gaps in the argument are and come out with with something that sounds right to you. And therefore, it's a fact. It's not a fact, Jane. The people who are actually running the businesses are saying that the problem is they can't get the staff. No, it's that the people they're saying that, but it's not that. Oh my God. Just shut up, you silly woman. And I mean that in a positive and helpful way. I do. Telling people who are running businesses <laughs> what the reason is they're failing, where they're saying that it is because they can't get the staff, and this person is saying, oh no, that's not it. Like she has any idea what she's talking about. But she seems certain that she does, which is alarming. Oh, three, four, I mean, you know, I just haven't got the patience, Jane, I really don't. If you refuse to accept reality, then uh, off into your own little world. Don't drag me into your furious purple nightmare. Perth, Mike. Uh, hello, Nick, yeah. Mike. A, yeah, let's give them a, just stop by, let's give them everything they want. Overnight, let's just give them give them what they want. Overnight, um, yeah. Well, yeah, that's what they, they want it done. They they want it done. Let's do it. Let's give the, let's give them it, and let's just watch our lives crumble before our eyes, because that's what will happen. Well, if we do it overnight, but no one's suggesting that that's going well, to be well. But that's going to that's ultimately that's that, that's what will happen. Well, I, I, yeah, I if if we gave, if we gave up oil and petrol and all, all of that overnight, then yeah, uh, our lives would be um, upended. It'd be shaken up like a snow globe. But no one's suggesting that 
that, w- that we do that. It would be impossible. We couldn't do that. We'd go back to the Stone Age. Well, you've just made, the, you've just made my point for me. They, well, but they don't say that. But they do they say that. Say, okay, they they, well, say, I just they, gave their two demands. Their two demands are, first, in reference to what it is that you're saying, that, to end all new licenses, approvals, and funding for fossil fuel projects. That doesn't mean stop using fossil fuels now. It means to end all new licenses, approvals, and funding for fossil fuel projects. What, what was wrong with, about that? They didn't, they didn't give a time limit. What time limit did they give? They, said end, they said end all new licenses, yes, approvals, by, and funding for when? fossil... By when? Do it right now. End all new licenses, approvals, and funding for fossil fuel projects. Right. In other words, stop licensing them. We do that, will they stop their, uh, I'll call it nonsense. Right. Well, that if they've suggested that that is one of their two demands. Oh, so so they'll can so we can give them everything that they want, but they'll still protest. N- well, no, obviously not. If we gave them everything they want, then that would be the end of the protests. Could I make my second point, please, Nick? Go ahead. Yeah, just I think I've just a bit got time. Yeah, uh, we've spoken before, and a uh, our global emissions in the United Kingdom point eight four. Five of 1% the global emissions so if the United Kingdom did what the Just Stop Oil wants, eventually did what they want, it would make little or no uh, difference to yeah. climate change we all, we all, we all have, climate We're all change. living on planet Earth so we all have to take care of where we're living Yeah, it can't just yeah. be the people in the, in the attic that um, that no, uh, no, recycle but, there. But have you, you, you not listening to what I'm saying? Of you, course I am, yes. So you're saying that because we would, uh, in this uh, tiny, insignificant little country, have a precious little effect on the uh, climate change of the planet, then we shouldn't bother, is what you're saying. Which is a nonsense argument. Boston, Lincolnshire, Wayne, thanks for waiting. Where are you taking me? Pardon? You said, oh, I'll, I'll take you after the break. Yes. Oh, Nick. Uh, oh, have you got a counselling couch I can lay on? Um, well, <laughs> tell me about your childhood. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> it was a long time ago. It was right. 65 years ago. Right. Nick, I was in town today, and uh, I was smoking a cigarette, mm-hmm. and I put it out, what well, I thought I did, and if anybody smokes, it, sometimes after you bend it and you try to put it, it sticks to your finger. Anyway, it fell out. I got about two yards, and I got the two big hands on my shoulder by two uh, police officers. Well, not police officers, is it PTOs you call them? Yeah, police uh, community officers. Yeah. That's right, Nick. Anyway, they said they wanted hundred pound off me. Wow. I thought. I said, what? I said, you just chuck that cigarette on the floor. Yes. I explained like I just explained to you, and there was adamant that I'm going to pay that £100. So I just carried on walking, making my way home, and in which it was about a mile, Nick. Mm. And all the time, they was asking for backup for the police to come. <laughs> And they kept saying to me, have you ever been in prison? And all this and that. I said, well, I have, actually, because in 1982, BBC One sent me into prison for nine weeks for non-payment of a TV licence. Wow, so you're a repeat offender. Well, indeed. Well, uh, yes, he he thought I was getting a big smoke. And he said, well, do you want to go back? I said, yeah, because I said it's now 46 (laughs) years later and I still ain't got a TV (laughs) licence. Okay. But anyway, so I, I, I got, uh, they followed me all the way to my doorstep. Mm. In, in this time, I did give them a name, I did give them my address. Right. But they was bully, bully, bully. I thought, walk a mile home with me, demanding £100. And I thought, well, that's how I'm going to pay for that secretary speeding ticket. Uh, what, Cruella Braverman's speeding ticket? Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, so what? What's the up upshot then? Well, I'm still waiting for the police to arrive. So I, I, I phoned the police about the incident, 
You phoned the police. Uh, what did you What well, did you yes. phone the police for? Because I was embarrassed. I didn't want them to come to my house. You oh, mean? okay. The, 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 the next that which you don't. So uh, you were confessing. Well, I did actually. Well, and they, they had no record of it. Oh. And the lady on the desk said to me, "Look, Wayne, don't worry about it." Uh, nobody will be coming out, but make sure you distinguish your cigarette properly. Yes. Which for all in fairness, yes. Yeah, that's right. For the for your um, benefit and safety, uh, please extinguish your cigarettes properly. Yeah, particularly Indeed. if you're in a forest at the time. And then, you know, I thought I'd share that story with you. Well, you did. Well, did I? <laughs> yes. And can I just say one more thing while I've got your attention? Of course. Since I have been uh, participating in your wonderful show, mm. your the other show won't allow me on because they heard me talking to uh, Mrs. Johnson last Sunday evening. Right. What other show? Is it, uh, oh, another station, you mean? Sorry, I do apologise. Another station. Another yeah. station. Oh right. Well, they they uh, they've got your number, mate. They'll they'll probably find you a hundred pound as well. <sighs> Watch for that letter at your door. Thanks a lot, Wayne. Best of luck, Kings Lynn. Hello, Craig. Good evening, Nick. How are you? Good, thanks. Excellent. You'll be pleased. I'm, I'm not going to speak about Brexit this evening. Good. <laughs> We've done that. Been there, done um, that. Oh, absolutely. Um, no, not my, my my reason for uh, speaking this evening is that I, I don't support the nurses' strikes. I think it's I think it's very good that they've uh, suspended the action where the St Norman Street Hospital is concerned. However, I do think that obviously it's clear that people's lives are being put at risk by these strikes. Hmm. And my own personal opinion is is that I think frontline emergency services, like the police, like the armed forces, like the prison service, actually should have no strike deals. Do you think that people's lives are being put at risk by the number of vacancies that they have in the NHS? Absolutely. But unfortunately, if you have inflation-busting play deals, or even the play deals that are significantly higher that can be afforded, mm. then there's going to be less money available to hire more staff, isn't there? Well, not necessarily. I mean, the, the government can just magic money out of thin air when it uh, wants, and uh, they, they can spend less money on battleships that don't work, and uh, there's no end of things that the government can do to um, mitigate any losses that they might suffer, uh, you know, paying for uh, more staff and paying them a, a, a more equitable wage. I don't think that well, affordability is a problem. I, I, th I think affordability is a very big problem. <laughs> but our, what makes you say national, that? Though? Our national debt is at an all-time high. The tax rate is the highest it's been for 80 years. Hmm. People are buckling under the weight of taxes. And uh, you, you mentioned ships that don't work. Well, with the security situation we're in at the moment, China, Russia... We uh, we do need to invest in those uh, the armed forces, and we do already invest quite a considerable amount. Uh, I think you'll you'll see it is a record sum that's been invested in the NHS. Well, um, yeah, but they, they, that that's just uh, spurious statistics. That is, I mean, that's just a government talking point. You, you're not going to repeat that well, stuff. It's, it, is, it is a fact. I, well, I agree it, with you, though. I do agree with you, though, that we do need a clear plan to tackle vacancies in the NHS. And what what plan might that though. be, though? You can't persuade people to go into a position that uh, comes with an enormous amount of debt through training and yet doesn't really pay the kind of money that they could earn uh, going to their local supermarket and stacking shelves. Well, they, 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 they earn considerably more than people who are on the minimum wage. The average nursing wage is £35,000 a year. And don't forget, over the last 20 years... Every couple of years, they get an incremental increase for, for long service. So if you take that into account, and don't forget, the public sector is actually now outstripping the, the private sector in, in terms of wages. Yeah, I'm not sure that that's true, but the fact is that nurses' pay has gone down by 20% in real terms over the last 10 years. Has yours? Uh, well, it has gone down, yes, definitely. By 20%? I think, I, th I, think you'll, I think you'll find... That if you take those uh, sp 
final increases in the nurses' salaries into account, it isn't 20% that are down. No, it is. I'm, I'm telling you, it's a fact. It's 20%. They're, da- they're down 20%. A fifth, a fifth of their wages they have essentially lost. Now, you don't notice it because it doesn't happen all at once, but it just, it, it, your ability to, um, to, uh, to pay for a decent lifestyle just vanishes. Uh, it just it it just can't be right, and and neither can it be right where the government can have uh, money for pretty much anything it likes as long as it uh, enriches friends and uh, donors, and uh, has uh, absolutely nothing at all for those people who are actually keeping us alive. I mean, the uh, the amount of fraud, the amount of money that has gone missing under Rishi Sunak's watch is uh, north of fifty billion pounds. I mean, we certainly can afford it if the government uh, wants to. They just appear not to want to in this case. And that does bring up wider concerns. I mean, they seem to have stripped the NHS pretty much clean over the last 13 years. Waiting lists were going down under the last Labour government. They have done nothing but go up under the Tories. The two are surely connected. Chelsea. Hello, Robert. Robert. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, I live in, in Clinton and Chelsea, Lubbock Road. Uh, I think we should have stayed in. I'm a 66-year-old person. And I think when we came out to Europe was the wrong time. I mean, the pandemic happened, and I think the government should have realised that we should be working together and not being a, a separate part Right. Um, yeah, but that... It was unfortunate timing, that's for sure, but then a pandemic is, doesn't ever come at the right time. There is no right time for a pandemic. Um, yeah, but I mean, like, uh, when, when you look at it, right, we, we, we came out when the pandemic started, but, right, and the pandemic happened over in, over in China and different things like that, and the government should have turned around and said... You know, let's hold on to this uh, thing because we need to be all together and not fighting it. F- fight, fight together and not separate. Right. OK, thanks, Robert. Chelmsford. Hello, Tom. Hello, Nick. Uh, I'll just give you very quickly, um, uh, if I may, um, two examples uh, of people that I've met that are, like, climate change activist people. This was uh, going back, I think the year was 2005, I believe. I was on a long-haul flight to Perth in Australia, and I was sat next to a, a, a guy who was, a, at that time, well, he was a few, he was a couple of years older than me. He said, um, and I, I tried, to get, tried to get talking to him with not all that much success, but um, he, was, um, he said he was on his way to a climate change conference. In he, Perth? Uh, yeah, in Perth. Yeah, so he, he'd flown from, and um, and um, so um, and I, I didn't point out the obvious mm. um, problem there. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I'm, I'm I'm far too polite for that. <laughs> but uh, uh, and then I, I said, um, um, well, uh, I point uh, that at that time, nearly twenty years ago, the theory was that uh, one of the things that we've been reading in the papers was that the North Pole, the North Pole, was going to melt. Right, and then all the all the cold water was going to come down and interrupt the north uh, the um, Gulf Stream, the North Atlantic Drift, yeah. and um, and 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 we'd and we'd be into a, like a sort of new ice age. And right. I put that to him, and he just he looked at me as if I was sort of stupid, and he sort of smirked and said, "No, no, no, it is real, you know." And um, so that was that was that interaction. Um, and another one was um, a couple of years later. No, it, no, I, I don't know, really understand that that exchange. No, it is real, but right. But you, yeah. so in, he, in other words, in other words, the, in other words, the way you was, said he, it, it implied that you were being sarcastic. Is that is that what you're saying? I think that he thought that he did. He wasn't really. Lis- I was at that time. I actually bought into all this sort of stuff. Right. And uh, and uh, and. Uh, but not I now. That, so what's changed? Well, the climate hasn't changed, has it? Seems all right well, to it, me. It has, though. I mean, well, I'm not sure it has. Seems all right. 
Right. Well, it's, it's, well anyway, it seems all right in Chelmsford. <laughs> Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, it seems pretty good. Yeah, it seems right. pretty good in Chelmsford. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, as long as you've done your research. Thanks, Tom. I am curious as to what this uh, this person is going to say at this Reform UK, this video that they've put out. Uh, her name is, uh, what is it? Alex Phillips. Calls herself That Alex Woman. Former MEP for the Brexit Party, head of media at UKIP. And they've, they've posted out this uh, video, which I don't know anything about, but my glamorous assistant tells me that I should play. And I guess now might be a good time to play it. Um, all right, so here it is. It's... Uh, a video that they tweeted out themselves by Alex Phillips at the Reform UK. It, this is a conference that's going on now, is it? Yes. Right, OK, here we go. British, and I am proud of my country's achievements and ethics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I am white and I don't feel ashamed. <laughs> I'm a woman, and I don't have balls down there, but I have balls, I tell you that. Whoa, steady on. I'm straight, and I passionately believe in the sanctity of marriage as happy households make a healthy society. Wow, look at that audience. It's <laughs> I am a curious Christian, and I rally against <coughs> efforts to change 2,000 years of community and shared morality to fit in with, with some kind of neoliberal dogma. What? Did you that know, make sense? determination no. to dissolve the glue that has held us together for centuries and destroy a culture that has enabled us to thrive and to prosper in harmony is now so pervasive that most of our politicians dare not speak against it. Yeah. Yeah. Big corporations aren't challenging it. No, they're trying to profit from it. And we, we the ordinary people, are being increasingly encouraged to just dumbly accept it. When we really don't want to. It? What's she talking about? Did we not see in the recent SNP leadership election so clearly attacks on a Christian candidate who stood up for her beliefs? Yeah. Only, yeah. only to be beaten by a man of Muslim faith never once held accountable for his. No. Now, look, all I ask is that the playing field is level. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. When will white, rich people ever get a break? Oh, my God, these people. Make Britain great. <laughs> That's their phrase. <laughs> That's their phrase. That's the phrase of the Reform Party. Make Britain great. You hear that, Donny? They're nicking your stuff. Don't be rude. Yeah, don't be rude, Reform Party. Very, very rude to steal. Make Britain great. How about make Britain great again? Because... Make Britain great implies that we didn't used to be great, or we have never been great. So what does that mean? Well, it was like... I'm offended. A parody Liz Truss <laughs> giving a speech at a local bowls club. Is that the equivalent? Yeah, uh, the audience. I've never seen an older, whiter collection of people in my life. I mean, most of them look like they had, uh, you know, like about five years after death. They were all propped up. The only thing that was keeping them in their seats was rigor mortis. Good grief. Hackney, Delphi. No hello. Yes. Yeah, hello. I'm on his side, actually, in some ways. Whose? Whose side? Uh, Dominic. Is he Rob? Uh, I know his first name. Uh, You're on his side, but you don't know yeah. what, what his name is. Right, OK. Um, no, I've heard of it today. I've heard of it. And Rob and Dominic, somebody's taken yeah. over. Will he be much better? I believe, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was like Boris Johnson, when they were all backstabbing him, mm. this woman, 21 years later, said he put his hand up her skirt. Why did you report it? People going on the bandwagon, following the herd. Right. This guy, right, and he he, he resigned. He he got into that job 
and Rishi Sunak had faith in him. I believe there was a lot in in politics backstabbing, right? I, and maybe maybe he's a bit like Basil Salty. He person he gets misunderstood because I heard he could be very nice. Because I'm a bit like that. But you're a bit. You you're a bit like what? Him intimidating, aggressive, but you've got to understand it. It is the way he is, and he can be nice, and he doesn't suffer fools gladly. Right. Okay. And there's a lot of jealousy, like my mum said. <laughs> and I've, I've seen like, a picture of him. Like he your mum like said, he, yeah. Yeah, my mother was very intelligent. Mm. Jealousy in this world and religion is the worst. It, it, it's a lot. That is what's wrong with this world. Religion. Well, it's one of the things uh, yeah, that's wrong with the and world. Jealousy. Yeah. Right. And okay. Jealousy. All right. Okay. Ne neither of which has anything to do with what we're talking about. But uh, uh, you, you have only heard about it today. You don't know what his name is, but you have a very, very strong opinion. I understand. Thanks, Delphi. Um, I've got no idea what that uh, thing is that she said about Boris Johnson. I hadn't heard that before, so um, we'll just pretend that we didn't hear that. Here's a call in Hull. Hello, Charles. Uh, Charles Hull? Charles Hull. <laughs> Hi, Nick. Charles. Um, yes, as your cub reporter, I decided to investigate how hard or how uh, easy it is to get authentication to be able to, um, you know, vote in the election. Is this one of the government-approved voter authority certificates? Oh, actually, it does actually say, I have got it here, voter authority certificate. Yeah. And, um, but I would like to say it was Tuesday morning, 10.30. I was, I was thinking I'm going to be in, in the queue for an hour, two yeah. hours. Yeah. I was, I walked through the doors, the usher... Hang on a minute. Walk through what doors? Uh, oh, the, the, you know, the doors of the, se uh, the centre. What centre? The, ca the council centre. There's a centre? Yeah, oh, yeah, in Hull. Where, where is it? Um, in the uh, centre? Near Alfred Gelder Street. <laughs> <laughs> right in the middle. <laughs> I yeah. remember that at least. <laughs> right. And 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 he ushered me to a young man behind a desk immediately. By the, the way, there was an usher. That's um, nice. Yeah. Did he have a and, torch? And I said, "Well, you know, I'm sorry, I don't have any uh, 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 identification photos from a photo booth." Yeah. Right. Why would anybody also, want to see a photo I've got of you? Like wild, you know, um, a bit of a wild man. I've got a bit of a big beard, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. I looked a, a bit, you know, um, Lon Chaney. Anyway, so that's for the old folks. You look um, like Long Chaney. Did Long Chaney have a beard? I'm not sure that's true. Is it? Well, actually, no. It depended on midnight. It depended on midnight. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Okay. Right. Gotcha. Yeah, he's um, a werewolf. Yes, right. and I'm, I, it's very bushy. So you, anyway, you look said, like look, a hippie. Yeah. Um, photos, and he said, "No, no." Yeah, to cut um, to cut a long story to, to the, cut a long the, story the, the short, wall, Charles. Hey, Charles, wall. Charles, to cut yeah, a long yeah. story short. Yes. Um, and everything went well, and then he said, and then he said, "Do you want it sent to your home?" I said, "No, I'll collect it because I want to make sure I can vote." Yeah, and. And, um, anyway, all over, done and dusted, inside 15 minutes. Well, that's excellent news, Sir Charles. I really am pleased to hear that. Thanks for that call. Um, appreciate it. Greenford. Hello, Paul. Hello, Nick. Yeah, I think, like, he, I think, though, the argument is he's the head of state, so the Constitution dictates that he's the top man, so I think we should maybe foot the bill, but it's controversial because, you know, um... The, 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 the amount of money you're saying he's accrued in wealth is, is quite substantial. And when his mother died, um, unlike the rest of us, he didn't pay any inheritance tax at all. Not a penny. He skipped it. He skipped it. He skipped he, it, he, yes. He, 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 he um, uh, yeah, they, 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 they let him off it. So um, it's, it's controversial, but... Um, Obviously, he's not the same shining light as Diana or even Meghan or Harry, but I think he's got his own strengths, and he's, he's quiet in a maybe disarming way. He's a bit quiet, isn't he? 
quiet. Um, I'm not sure about that. I mean, he, th he makes his feelings known. Whether he does so publicly or not is, um, is debatable. But uh, he's not shy of um, expressing an opinion. Let's put it like that. Hendon. Hello, Josh. Uh, hello. Um, well, I, the reason I called in is because uh, you, I, I think you've got it all wrong. It's not about... Um, the, the reason why there, is a, a, there are there's so many vacancies in the job market is because we're not training our own people. Yes, training but if our own people, people don't want help. those jobs, they, what, I mean, you, what's the plan? To force us to do them? Well, there, 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 are, ways, there are ways to incentivize people who are, who are unemployed How? and not... Well, well, we don't have a large pool of unemployed people in this country, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, well, unfortunately I mean, for we, economists we, we, and those who wish to, uh, you know, avail themselves of, of uh, unemployed people, we, we don't have a large unemployment problem in this country. Uh, I'm pretty sure we do. We, we well, have a lot I'm, of I'm telling you, I'm telling you that we don't. It's it's a fact. We don't. I mean, economists would say that full employment is about three or four percent unemployed. You, you always have to have a pool of available talent for businesses that want to expand or, uh, you know, add to their staff. Um, the, 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 that may be the case. There, there is also an issue of ghost jobs, which are increasingly wasting job seekers' time. So that's also What's a ghost uh, job? An issue. A ghost job is where they, is where they advertise um, is where they advertise that there is a vacancy, but in fact they, the job does not actually exist. They're doing it in order to, uh, to, to, to make it seem like there's more going on than there actually is. What are you talking about? Who, who are these people who are doing that? Well, according to the Labour Department, there were about 10.8 million job openings in January, um, and yet many, and yet many people find. And there's a, there was a survey done by um, by Clarify Capital. By who? Sixty percent of job Clarify Capital. It's an online loan company. Um, they uh, there was the, the survey found that sixty percent of job postings online are kept active for more than one month. The bulk of these openings are left open for two or three right, months. Well, I, I, I've got I've got no idea. I, 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 I don't know about months. any of those uh, things. It's completely irrelevant to what we're talking about. There, Britain, it's, it's utterly irrelevant. Britain now has thirteen thousand seven hundred ninety-three fewer pubs, bars, hotels, restaurants, nightclubs, and other licensed premises than it had three years ago. The main reason why the people whose businesses have closed, they say the main reason for that is because they can't get the staff. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know about ghost jobs, but these people are not shutting up their businesses because they can't <laughs> attract ghosts. Joining me now to talk about this, John Rental, Chief Political Commentator for The Independent. Good evening, John. Hi there. So, what's your take on this? Well, um, my assumption is that uh, Dominic Raab would probably survive. I mean, I thought he would survive before, but, I mean, the longer this goes on, and he isn't sacked, uh, and he doesn't resign voluntarily, the uh, more likely it seems uh, to be that he'll, he'll stay, because there isn't a slam-dunk case against him. Are there echoes of um, Pretty Patel here? Well, no, because in her case, the independent advisor on ministerial interests, um, and I can't remember who it was at the time, because uh, we've been through so many, <laughs> yes. um, concluded that she had actually been guilty of bullying, although he did qualify it, I mean, by saying she probably wasn't aware of it or something like that. Just enough to give Boris Johnson the, the chance to sort of overrule his finding and, uh, and keep her. Whereas I think um, this is even less... Um, ad I mean, the, the findings here must be less adverse. Why do you uh, say to, that? To Dominic Raab. Well, because uh, if if there had been a clear finding that Dominic Raab, Dom, Dominic Raab was guilty of bullying, then I think Rishi Sunak would have had no hesitation in uh, in sacking him. And I think the fact that he hasn't done that means that uh, the evidence is not clear cut. Really? Because I mean, it seems to me like this would just feed perfectly into the war on woke, labelling sil civil servants as whinging snowflakes and um, they should just get on with their work and, furthermore, <laughs> get back to the office. Yeah, I mean, there are Conservatives who take, take that line. I mean, I don't think that's, that would be a sensible line for the Prime Minister to take because he has set so much store by 
being uh, by setting higher ethical standards than than Boris Johnson. I mean, he hasn't been explicit <laughs> about that, but uh, he, when he became prime minister, uh, made quite a big deal about integrity. Uh, about said, integrity. Yeah. How do you think he's doing on that subject of integrity? Well, not 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 too bad. I mean, he clearly is. I mean, I think he he he, he does have higher. Uh, ethical standards than Boris Johnson. I mean, that's not a, not a very high bar to clear, possibly. No. Uh, but he does want. You know, it's, it's a tricky one. This because I mean, if if people think that Dominic Raab is is guilty of beat, then uh, then there is quite a low threshold for for just deciding to cut him loose. But uh, I think Rishi Sunak wants to do the uh, wants wants to go through the proper pr- uh, procedure. Uh, give give Dominic Raab a, a, a fair hearing, uh, and then decide. And then I think that means that uh, the deputy prime minister is going to stay. Yeah, but it's it's not really about. I mean, it is about Dominic Raab, but it's not really about Dominic Raab. It's about <laughs> the uh, the Tories trying to slough off this nasty party tag. Yes, and um, isn't Dominic Raab's problem, or one of them, that he does appear to be deeply unlikable? Yes. Well, I mean. Clearly, he's very unpopular with with a lot of people who've worked for him, and that I think is a is a real disability in a politician. And I think I think you could reshuffle him if you were prime minister uh, on on the grounds that it's you know, you're not an effective politician unless you can uh, work uh, harmoniously with, uh, with with the people who work for you. Um, but, Do you think that would work, though, shuffling him? Because it, it, if the allegations are true, then he's a serial bully, regardless of where he actually is well, uh, operating from. Yeah, but wait a minute. I mean, the, the thing is, we haven't actually seen the report yet, so we don't know the, that the allegations are true. And, mm. and they're not it, they're not so obviously damning of uh, of Dominic Raab that he has to go. Uh, he's He's now seen the report. Um, and he thinks he can he can ride it out. It is being reported in all the uh, in all the papers uh, overnight. Um, and so, you know, unless this, I mean, we, and people will make up their own minds when they see when they see this report, which will presumably be published uh, tomorrow when uh, when the prime minister makes his decision. Uh, and then then everybody can argue about it. But I mean, it's obviously arguable. Uh, rather than clear cut one way or the other. Do you think that he, he actually is going to publish the report in full? Because there's so many reports about uh, this, <coughs> about the actions of the government that we haven't seen. I mean, where's the Russia report, for instance? The Russia report? What on earth is that? <laughs> exactly. Is this some conspiracy <laughs> theory you're trying to spring on me late at night? Now, the Russia report was that. Uh, that was some utter nonsense about uh, about Russia interfering in our in our elections, wasn't it? Which was which was completely unfounded. Now, I mean. This will this will be published. I think I think number ten has said this this report will be will be will, will be published when the prime minister has made his decision. Right now, if let's um, uh, let's uh, f- fantasise about seeing the back of uh, Dominic Raab, if he does go, who might replace him? Do you think? Well, I don't think he is going to go though. So I think, I mean, can we not play the game? If well, well, no, I think we can play the game in the sense that you know he. I mean, what, what you're saying is absolutely right there, that that he, he has put a lot of people's backs up. He can't be a very effective minister if he just if, if people don't like working for him so much. Uh, so it might make sense to reshuffle him, but, uh, but I don't think he's going to be sacked tomorrow. Um, and if he is reshuffled later, then, uh, then there are a number of uh, women ministers who are in line for promotion to that uh, Justice Secretary post. Uh, Lucy Fraser, I think, is the, is the name that I've seen uh, bandied about. Right, just as long as it's not Swella Braverman, or Pretty Patel. <laughs> <laughs> well, not Swella Braverman. Is, uh, is she's, home, she's Home Secretary. That'd be a demotion for her. Uh, well, do you not think that she deserves that? <laughs> Don't want to answer well, that one. <laughs> Well, I'd demote her a bit further than that. Yes, yeah, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> yeah. Finally, we agree on something. Thanks very much, John. John Rental, Chief Political Commentator for The Independent. Kingston. Hello, David. Yeah, hi, Nick. I really think that Diane should have clarified what she meant rather than just, um, you know, just step back from it completely because there clearly must have been some belief that she had from there. Perhaps it didn't come out very well. But you just clarify what you mean, because she just looks really clumsy and silly by what she's done. And she kind of makes herself guilty by doing so. I don't necessarily think that there was perhaps anything wrong with what she said. And I kind of agree with you that it was more of a 
discussion about semantics, i.e. are ginger people, for example, a race? Are, are Jewish people actually a race? Um, it's, it is actually debatable. They're certainly not listed as a, se- as a separate ethnic group according to the government. They're they, 18 ethnic groups, and Jewish people aren't, aren't considered to be a separate ethnic group, even, even though... Is that right? I understand... Yeah, even though I understand that they can be considered a race. But then again, you could think about three different races. All three of those different races could all convert to Judaism. So it clearly is debatable. Right. But I would love to know what, what her intention and what her main point was, because it clearly didn't come across very well. Um, and I think she would have done much better just clarifying what she meant rather than just rejecting all of it and just looking really kind of clumsy and silly. Right. Well, I wonder, I mean, if reading between the lines, I wonder if what she meant was that you can um, you, you can see from a distance somebody who is black, but you cannot see from a distance somebody who is, for instance, a traveller or somebody who is Jewish. And so uh, people who would be inclined to discriminate against uh, uh, those groups would find it easier to do so if um, they were presented with a black person than they were presented with a, a Jewish person. I think that maybe that's what she was just claiming the word racism for uh, those of uh, different colour skin to those who are abusing them. Yeah, I, w- I would believe so because she certainly didn't say that they didn't face discrimination. She certainly didn't say that they that they weren't um, facing what was the word she said Pre- prejudice. Prejudice. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so, so absolutely that that's the case. She wasn't saying that one was worse than, than the other. So, see, it's not even that we can get in, into that into that debate. I mean, if, if that was the case, we, we could look into the fact that are ginger people more likely to die in police custody, for example? Are their children more likely to die during childbirth? I mean, if these are the issues, if that's the case for Jewish people or whatever, then that can all be debated. But as far as I know, she wasn't actually talking about that. So I don't see why she just didn't clarify what she meant. It's, it's a shame that this had to happen. It could have just been uh, an academic, you know, question or something that could have been spoken about. And instead, have we really, as our society really got to the case where you can't even really talk about these things and get slammed, oh, you're anti-Semitic and now what is just to to lose her job. She might be clumsy, but is it, is, it, is it really necessary? Surely, right now, we can have this conversation and none of us should be, able, should be accused of being racist unless we are overtly are being so. Yes, I think that there are now a handful of subjects which um, y- you would be very ill-advised to even approach for fear that the reaction of anything that you may say or uh, any uh, misstatement or misspeaking might get you into, um, well, might get you cancelled. I think that's sort of where we are right now. It's, it's a little bit frightening. Paul in Dorset. Hello, Craig. Good evening. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I, I uh, definitely think that the uh, migrant refugee sort of situation needs some sorting out, as I, as I think we all do. Yeah. Um, in, what, in what way? Well, for me personally, uh, uncontrolled immigration... Uh, especially illegal. Um, taking that aside, I can apply this to my life. If I was struggling in life, um, which I am, um, I may need a better life. Should I kick down the door of LBC, demand a job, or would I expect to be thrown out of the building and not receive a job at all for the way that I went about my actions? Right, so you're me, you're equating the, knocking, kicking down our door to coming here illegally by boat. In in the same tense text that uh, I need support, I'm struggling. I have my own reasons of of needing help. Yeah, just like someone may do from fleeing another country. Right, but is it the is it the appropriate way to go about it in the way that I described? But the way you, the way you, that you described, uh, you're comparing two different things. Because if somebody is fleeing oh, uh, 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 persecution, if somebody is fleeing for their life, then that's rather different. Because if you were outside our building, Craig, and you were dying, but I'm then starving, you would Nick. right. But I'm starving. Okay. Well, if you were outside our building and you were starving to death, then you would think that somebody in this building would help you. Well, I wouldn't expect it. It would be nice to to see some humanity. You, you think that people it. in this building would let somebody starve to death outside? No, I'm not accusing anyone of allowing that to happen. I, I thought you were. Expect it. No, 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 I didn't say... Uh, no. You wouldn't I, expect I wouldn't it. Expect. You wouldn't expect that people in this country would help you if, you, if they s- saw you starving to death. Wow, you think um, 
You don't think much of people in this country, Craig. I'm alarmed. Uh, I recognise this country less and less. Chelmsford. Hello, Tom. Hello, Nick. Yeah, very quick point. Um, I just a lot of the thrust of what you've been saying over the last sort of on and off for the last hour or so has been that um, politicians are liars. They tell lies. Mm. Um, they sloganeer, and a lot of what they're saying um, is not true and yes. is going to turn out to be false. And I think that while some people, uh, I think most people know that, and I think po most people, the decisions that they make when they vote um, are not necessarily to do with what politicians have said or promised them, and that they perhaps make up their own minds on the basis of their own conclusions. But what, what is there then that you could vote on if you don't believe a word they say? Uh, well, Cut of their uh, suit. Well, other things that you, you might... I mean, uh, I think that people do point, understand that they that they are being lied to by politicians, but it doesn't mm -hmm. stop them believing that you know, despite all of their experience, you do still mm -hmm. believe what people tell you if they look you in the eye and they promise things. It's it's hard yeah, not to. Well, some some people will certainly, but I mean, uh, some I think that I mean a, a politician comes to a certain point of view for for many reasons, and, and some will not. I mean, we can all look at the world around us, the, 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 what's in play, the, the politics that are in play and, and what's going on, and, and think, well, we think, I think, that this or, or that should happen, and, and by voting or, or, or saying that mm. this or that thing, I can affect this in a way that, 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 that I feel is, is, is good, and, and, and is, is good. Right. Whatever that means. I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever that means. All right, thanks, Tom. Enfield, Mark. Nick, good morning. Mark. Um, the um, Trump video, uh, sorry, the Trump clip, clip is on YouTube, reference Jane about an hour ago. Oh, yeah, Trump and um, Dame Edna. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, on the Terry Wogan show, I believe. Right. Yeah, that's def definitely online. Okay. Yeah. And also, in my view, mm -hmm. Nick has been a glamorous assistant. Me? No, Nick has been a glamorous assistant. I, but I'm Nick. No, you're... What's your glamorous assistant's name? Nobody cares. Okay. <laughs> That's right, isn't okay. it? Apparently. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, a, a final, a final, a final. Yeah. Um, and in closing, yes. And, and in closing... Where did you get that goofy clip from? Did you edit it? Did you guys edit it? I can't find it nowhere. What, well, this it. one? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that one. I have no yeah. idea. I, I can't remember where all these come from. I've got hundreds of these things. Do you know what? One final, and this is a good one for you. Yeah, P.S. Yeah, P.S. Postscript. You should do a stand-up act next door, in next door's theatre. I'm nervous, definitely right? not going to do that, but thanks for the suggestion. Thanks, Mark. I prefer to do a sit-down act. Much better. But um, you know they were going to scrub 4,000 EU laws. Y y you remember the EU? Boo! Yeah, that's right. And it was part of um, uh, Smug's little scheme to get rid of 4,000 laws, you know, most of which are uh, in place in order to benefit you, the consumer. You, the human being. You, the worker. You know, they, they don't just make this stuff up to be uh, irritating. It's for our protection. Despite pledges to scrub more than 4,000 laws from the statute book, only one in five European Union laws is set to be scrapped in Fishy Sunak's so-called Brexit bonfire. What? Only one in five? Why, that's nearly 20%. The Prime Minister gave his public backing in January to what's called the Retained EU Law Bill, which is the opposite of what it looks like. It's not retained EU law. They're going to ditch the EU law, abolish more than 4,000 EU laws before the end of this year. Hey, what kind of numpty thought that that would be a good idea? My view. Exactly. However, in a briefing to senior Tory Eurosceptic MPs on Monday, Kemi Badenoch, the Trade Secretary, said that only 20% of those laws, not 4,000, just 800, were likely to be scrapped. Isn't that an absolute tragedy? No. No. I mean, why aren't we getting rid of all those hated EU laws, like the one that says, 
Uh, you know, like the laws about, um, got no idea. And neither do you. And neither do they. They were going to get rid of 4,000 laws without actually reading what they were. Morons. We're surrounded by morons. The number that Kemi bad enough is proposing to remove is smaller than the 1,400 EU laws which were found in the National Archive as part of a Whitehall hunt for needless EU laws. I mean, you remember that hunt, don't you? When Smug asked the readers of The Sun which EU laws they they most disliked. <laughs> <laughs> and answers came there none. I mean, that's pretty embarrassing. That top-hatted twiglet, his entire position in government used to be to seek out Brexit uh, benefits. Couldn't find a single one. They got so embarrassed about it that they, they axed that job entirely. That job doesn't exist anymore. Kemi, bad enough, as in bad enough to be a part of this government, reportedly told MPs that civil servants had told her it was impossible to remove 4,000 EU laws, the vast bulk of which are in the Environment Department. Which is typical. Blooming activist lefty civil servants holding us back, denying the ordinary, hard-working people to be free of restrictions that they don't know exist. But it makes sense because you just can't throw out laws that prevent people from being poisoned or the land ruined or the air polluted. I mean, the kind of laws that are there to protect us. And Conservatives MPs know this and acted accordingly, by which I mean they threw a fit you could see from space. <coughs> Conservative MPs told The Telegraph they were furious. But being furious is what defines them. They exist in a permanent state of purple agitation. The meeting with the ERGs, the European Research Group's grandees on Monday, soon descended into acrimony. <laughs> One MP told the Telegraph it really was a bad meeting. Well, of course it was. It was the ERG. Naturally, it was a bad meeting. A second Conservative MP pinned the blame on Kemi Badenoch personally, saying, you need a tough minister, but she's a lame minister who is having rings run round her by Remainer officials. We need a tough minister, and Kemi is proving to be a huge disappointment. I bet there's not one single one of those ERG swivel-eyed Fruit Loops that has any idea which laws they don't want on the books. It's just a feeling that they've got, that they've been denied the Brexit they dreamed of, principally because it doesn't exist. Those sunlit uplands are overcast and raining. I mean, they dreamed of being buccaneers, didn't they? Riding the ocean wave of glorious Brexit Britain, telling other countries to do what we say because we're British, damn it. And to use Dominic Raab's turn of phrase when he was dismissing a disabled woman calling for less cuts to disabled benefits, all of that buccaneering stuff is just a childish wish list. That's what Dominic Raab said. My name is Dominic Raab and I'm a Tory. Totally believe you. But one particularly purple Tory MP said that because bad enough won't get rid of all EU laws at a stroke that her chances of being the next leader are over. Because some people think that Kemi Badenoff is in a race to see how dreadful she can be to compete with Cruella Braverman and Pretty Patel and Steve Barkley and, well, pff, you know, you name it. They all seem to be on evil manoeuvres to be the next leader of the Tory party. Once the fishy uses up all of his integrity. This government. This government, Mr Speaker. And the ERGers are extra angry, of course, because it's Friday. Or there's a vowel in the month, or they don't really need a reason because they're especially unhappy that their beautiful Brexit is taking another hammering from reality. Reality makes them very angry. Damn it. Conservatives are unsure, unsure, whether Number 10 have been briefed on bad enough's plans for, the, uh, for that uh, bill to get rid of all the uh, EU laws, the retained EU law bill. Rishi will be livid, said one of the MPs. Oh, yeah? Why is that, then? Is he livid because we're being held back by environmental laws designed to protect, you know, the environment? Has the Tory party now added the environment to its list of woke things to be against? 
I bet ruining the environment is his number one priority. It's the country's number one priority. It's my number one priority up and down the country, and that will be our focus. That will be our focus. Mr Speaker. A government source said of uh, Kemi bad enough. She is a true Brexiter. She delivered the CPTPP to show the country a brave future outside the EU. <laughs> and she's now got a grip of the process. She's got a grip, Fishy. I'm gripping it. He's gripping it too. And as for the CPTPP, the benefits of that to the economy are negligible at best. I mean, we've already got bilateral trade agreements with nine of the member countries of the CPTPP. We've got zero trade tariffs with most CPTPP members already. So forecasts have suggested that the economic gains from that membership are going to be small. The fine print of the government's own analysis shows that the deal is set to increase GDP, gross domestic product, by 0.08% over the next 15 years which is 5,000% smaller than what we lost leaving the EU. You know, but apart from that, everything's going just fine. What a way to run a country, eh? Dreadful. Cambridge, Hassan. Yeah, uh, hi Nick. I've been listening to uh, the, that show, the experts, etc. And look, I, I think uh, the, uh, the foreign minister is deliberately trying to um, uh, stoke threat of war. Look, the Chinese are very long-term thinkers. They Every year, their economy becomes larger, the technology improves, the military capabilities improve, etc. So somehow to think that they will risk it all on this sort of mad invasion of Taiwan in 2027 is, is quite absurd. To be honest, a number of your experts, when you ask them, they all sort of agreed that this 2027 is a very dubious date. Um, I think there is... Uh, a lot of sort of anti-China sort of um, uh, rumor mongering, etc., that the Chinese are taking away, are stealing our technology, and their uh, TikTok is making our kids dumb and all that. <laughs> I think that isn't there a little truth to both of those things. Though I mean, China <laughs> has been accused many times of stealing yeah. the West's technology in order to get yeah. a, a you know a, a sort of a leg up. And yeah. is, is it is there any doubt that TikTok is making kids <laughs> stupid? No, but I mean, so is Instagram and, and all these well, other yeah. uh, platforms, right? So, and, and they look, I mean, the technology, the truth is, yes, they're stealing some technology, but they're also uh, paying the most amount for using patents. They're also making huge technological strides. They're uh, developing their own things. Uh, and look, I mean, in some areas like 5G, like uh, rapid transport, uh, building cities, they're far ahead of us in technology and mm -hmm. we'll start stealing from them. So this idea that somehow this technology transfer or stealing is only one way is, is, is pretty unfair. Look, I, I think that the, the, we have seen how bad the, uh, the, the consequences of sanctions uh, against Russia were, right? And China is a 10 times larger exporter and importer, right? So the, the consequences of that will be far worse. So this sort of uh, rumor, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, mongering and sort of saying China is doing this, that is very uh, sort of unhelpful. But the I problem is, is, isn't the problem that if China does invade and takes the semiconductor business that Taiwan is preeminent in, yeah. and then uh, sort of hold, either refuses to send those semiconductors to the rest of the world or holds the rest of the world uh, hostage, um, to yeah. jacks up the price and so on, that really will undermine our way of life. I mean, everything is based around those computer chips. No, but look, I, I think it was Einstein who said that, look, I don't know how the Third World War will be fought, but the Fourth World War will be fought with sticks and stones. So <laughs> if there is actually an invasion, right, this, microchips are the least of our worries. It will be the start of another mega war. These are both sides. Have, I mean, China has nuclear weapons. It has massive military. The Americans have that. So I think this idea that somehow it's, a, it's the chips, we all want the chips, etc. Look, frankly, the gap, there is a gap between Taiwan and China and the rest of the world. But I can assure you, within 10 years, that gap will be a lot smaller. So this idea that this is somehow going to drive uh, the entire sort of conflict, I think, is 
is wrong. I think there is one thing which is I'm worried about is that the Americans are very threatened because their predominant position as, as the largest economy, as the most technologically advanced country has been threatened. So there is a lot of sort of, um, I think they are also Pelosi going there, uh, Trump sort of uh, tirades against China, etc. Well, is America has been on top of the that. world for a good long while yeah. now, yeah. and they are looking at possibly becoming um, uh, uh, not occupying that position in yeah. the uh, not too far distant future. So they're not going to be that uh, they're not going to accept their diminished place yeah. in the world happily. Exactly. So, so, but then what is our role, right? Are we sort of uh, vassals of America and we just march to their tune and do well, another appears, Iraq war for them? Or do so. we sort of say, guys, let's lower down the uh, the tensions? Because look, China for 90% of human history was the largest economy in the world. And for a couple of hundred years coming back to... Yeah, they're coming back. All right. He, he uh, forgot himself just for a moment there. Uh, they, um, China uh, lost his mind. That's uh, its mind. I think that's what he was uh, saying. Except he is—he expressed himself in builder's language. Hull. Hello, Charles. Oh, oh hey, Nick. I thought you were sounding a bit more chipper, but um, I am. Oh, you are. Well, what do you mean? That's but, good. but, 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 and it's a big but. Yeah. What but? <laughs> Sorry, carry on, sorry. No, you said I was sounding more chipper, but... Oh, well... Um, implying that I'm not. Well, you know, I, I, I like to think that you still carry on no matter what. Yes. I'm under a, a, a tremendous... Not only am I very, very ill, but I'm under a tremendous amount of pressure, and yet uh, all, all I radiate is H-A-P-P-Y-ness. That's me. Exactly. Um, it's a brief one, by the way. Let's hope so. <laughs> um, yeah, you were talking about, you know, people working and, you know, um, my friend Bonzo, he lives down the way. Anyway, he worked for two years for a certain supermarket, you know, the top four kind of thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's working there and he's shoveling trolleys around for eight, £28 a week. Now, now this must, guy, wait, he's wait, 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 wait. Twenty-eight yeah, yeah, yeah. pound a week. How many? Twenty-eight pounds a week. How many hours does he do? Oh, sorry, I've got it wrong. Oh, bum. Um, <laughs> uh, twenty-eight hours. Sorry, right. a week. Right. How much does he get? Uh, oh God, what's uh, minimum wage? Right. Carry on. Right, and and he's and he's he's intelligent guy. Although he is a drummer, you know why he's called Bonzo, oh, Led a, Zeppelin. A, a drummer, right? Yeah. <laughs> you mean he hangs? Is what? What do you call a man who hangs around with musicians? A drummer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, also, I mean Bonzo from Led Zeppelin. Yeah. So well, anyway, but after two years, they still he, they gave him thirty-two hours every now and then. So he gave up. He actually gave up because it was after two years. It was ridiculous. What's the point of this call, Charles? Um, don't work for a supermarket. Right, not for two years. Not pushing trolleys for two years. I mean, he must have been really inept at his job that they kept him pushing trolleys for two years. I mean, at least uh, if he'd been in, in any way competent at his task, they'd have given him the seat next to the machine that goes boop. All of those people, the uh, the uh, boop people, they're, they're all going to get fired soon. Every single one of those jobs is going to be done by a robot. Affirmative. I mean, they've got to be the first to go. But thanks a lot, Charles, for, you know, whatever that was. Perth, Mike. Uh, hello, Nick. Mike. Some point I'll go... Uh, you were on a similar, a similar conversation, and I phoned in and got to speak to your good self, and asked, uh, "What? Uh, well, should we have a limit on the amount of migrants dash immigrants, migrants dash uh, refugees who come into the country? Mm. Uh, what, what limit would that be?" I asked you, and you said you didn't know. Yeah, yeah, you didn't know. Well, you well, want me to put uh, a number you, on you, it? I, I was just wondering. Have you thought about it, and what, what, what figure would you suggest? I would suggest that a number which most benefits the country. Well, what, what would that be? Would that be 100,000? Would that be half a million? Would that be a, a million, two million? 
Well, Mike, if there's a million jobs that are currently not being done and Britons are either unwilling or unskilled or unable to do them, then we ne and those jobs need to be done for the benefit of the nation, then who would you suggest does them? No, no, I'm a, I'm a, well, I would suggest, in that case, you know what, I would think a simple solution would be the, go the government say that we had, whatever government that was, would make sure that these people... Uh, and excuse my friends, we'd get off their backside uh, and not make life so easy for them uh, not working. Uh, and and they're... Wh which we'd, people? We'd a, which people are you talking about now? Getting off their I'm backside? The same, I'm talking about the same people that you're talking about. The, the million people who are unwilling to work. No, 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 no. Not million people that are unwilling to work. Million jobs that are not being done. Well, <laughs> aren't there... Who, who should I, do those? I, that's what I'm saying to you. I believe there are a million unemployed in this country uh, who who are quite capable, who are quite happy to, and they haven't gone back. To, have you not heard? They haven't gone back to work after the the COVID. Right. Well, people who want to retire should they be forced no, no. back into work? No, I'm, I'm talking about uh, fifty, uh, just round about the fifty fifty age. Yeah. They have retired, yeah. they've decided to retire early, so they should be forced to go and work in fields and pick no, tubers out of the ground. I'm, I'm not talking about them, I'm well, talking I, I'm, about... That's what I'm talking about. Those jobs are not being done. Fruit oh, see, picking, no. like fruits and um, vegetables and, um, you know, farm work is not being done. We don't have people to butcher uh, meat, so uh, carcasses <laughs> are being thrown... Well, it's not funny. Carcasses are being thrown away. Farmers are going out of business. Small companies are going out of business. So these jobs are not being done. So if we don't have the people to do them, who should do them? Well, Nick, could I uh, digress slightly? Well, you're not going to answer that question. Well, it was, it was so convoluted, I, I lost track uh, of it. Okay, well, i just refer you to the question that I first gave you. There's a million jobs not being done in this country. Brits can't do them. Who should do them? Can I tell you why there's a million jobs not getting done? When Before, a, I'm talk, going to talk about Brexit very briefly. <sighs> Brexit, because a, I listen to you and I shake my head sometimes. Before Brexit, Ditto. before freedom of movement... There was no problems with employment. Uh, I'm 75 now, but I, I remember a time when farmers used to... Uh, the hospitality business used to come to our schools and they used to uh, say, look, there's so many jobs. Farmers used to come actually come to my door, come to round, round our doors, when freedom of movement... And there was never any, any problem... Right, with that's, people, yes, well, it, was precisely right. With and then we people. left the European Union and now a million jobs aren't being done. So who should do well, them? I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to explain who should do them. I'm trying to... If you just give me two seconds, please. Uh, you know, at that time, all jobs... We, there was no, no need for freedom of movement because all the jobs... But now, since, <laughs> since freedom of movement harmed... Farmers, the hospitality age, uh, business, businesses, they sat on their backsides, lifted up a phone and said, send me a squad of people from Eastern Europe. They didn't, they, they actually, they actually neglected the, the, the people from this country who actually did the work. Like, people in this country don't want to do that work. They don't want to have, th like, two months in the middle of summer to do work and then, and, and live in a, a shed on site while they're doing it, British people can't just up sticks and leave their families and their friends and everything that they know to go and live in the middle of a field. That's not who we are. We do other jobs, better jobs, better paying jobs with, uh, better, um, with better conditions. So if we're going to have a farming business in this country, for instance, then we need other people who are more desperate than we are, who uh, come from places where the money that they will earn here is more significant, back home. That's what we need. Either that or we just give up on farming. I used to, do, Nick, I used to do that work. I used to go to the Berries. Right, and how was it? I, sorry? How was it? Terrible. Exactly. People don't want to do that work. Anyway, Mike, we're going around and around and around. Uh, the, the answer to the question is, if Brits can't do the work and the work needs to be done, then we're going to have to get somebody else to do it. 
Now, if we've got all of these people that are sitting there costing us uh, a, a large amount of money and we're, and we're not and we're refusing to allow them to work, well, what does that tell you about that policy? The policy is obviously completely insane. If we could use them for the benefit of the nation, then why uh, is the government insistent on using them for the benefit of the government in order to try to extract votes from people who um, just are like performative cruelty to foreigners? You listen to me and shake your head? Well, I, I uh, put it right back at you. Let's have a call in uh, Liverpool. Hello, Vincent. Hello. Vincent. How are you? Good, thanks. Uh, I was just, uh, before I was going to the topic of uh, what I was going to talk about, you know, you're talking about everyone killing each other and yeah. all that. Mm. Uh, but but it's not amazing. But the thing is, Nick, you, you mentioned the white fella shooting a black fella, but... You know, all the others, you never mentioned that. But uh, anyway, by and by... All the, the others? The what, day, what others? Well, all the, other, all the other murders that you were mentioning. Yeah. You, never, you never actually mentioned the colour of the people... Uh, well, that is true. Yeah, it's just what was written you know, down. It's you know, just what was written down in front of me. I mean, I, I, I okay, yeah, all right. Well, it don't mean, it don't mean no. Never mind. Most people in America who kill most people in America are black kids shooting each other. Is that what yeah, you want me to say? I've just thought about what you said. Right. To be honest, when talking about the burger, you know, when that fellow was talking about the price of the burgers and all that, I was listening and I thought at the end he was going to say, "Plus the flight to Acapulco." Yeah. You know. It was that day, wasn't it, to be honest? The last time I spent that much money, I got a suit, a tie, and a pair of shoes. Yeah, I think I made that joke, Vincent. <laughs> no, no, yeah, I'm not I, I, I made, I made that one. That. Yeah, all right. Okay, thanks a lot, mate. Another listener with material. Oh, no. I've done that one already. Alicante. Hello, Jane. Oh, good evening, Nick. Hello, Jane. I'll keep it simple. Yeah. Uh, firstly, Tiger Balm. What's that? Tiger Balm is fantastic. What is it? It is a pure ointment, which I believe originated out east, probably Thailand. Do they actually have to kill the tiger to get it, or can they just mm, squirt it out no, of it? No, sweet. They don't extract anything from the tiger. But honestly, that on your chest or a headache... Any pain you've got on your muscles, you rub it in and I guarantee you it will help. What does Secondly, it smell like? Does it smell like tigers? It, it smells, yeah, I mean, because I've laid with tigers. And, and you've yeah, done what now? I laid with tigers. You laid with tigers? Yes, I did, but that's a whole other story. It's, it's, yeah, it's a very interesting <laughs> story. How did you lie with a tiger? Well, I was in Thailand and I was laying with tigers, but there we are. Were they chained to the ground? Did they have their, no, their paws? No, no. Like, did they, they... They, were, they were walking around, but All I right. want to help you anyway. Yeah. So, tiger balm, trust right. me, works. Okay. Pure CBD oil CBD, works. DVD, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Want to score and, some pot? Yeah. Yeah, but pure. Thirdly, <laughs> thirdly, black. Pepper. Do you like black pepper? Well, I put it on stuff, yeah. Black pepper... But I wouldn't I... eat it on its own. No, no, no. I have I haven't had any vaccinations. I've never caught the bad bat disease, as you call it. Yeah. And black pepper is one of the best ways of keeping colds and flus well, and what everything. What do you, what do, you do with it? Just put it on your food. Well, you I do that. It. We'll keep doing it, but more, more, Nick, more. Right, more, okay. Yeah, and tiger balm. Tiger balm, yeah. Poor little Trust tigers. Me. Oh. It's not the tigers, it's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> they, they get a tiger and they have to squirt at its balm. <laughs> Awful. No, it, it, trust me, it is, you, you try it, yeah. and every ache in your body, it, when you've put it on, mm. You and just you stop thinking about all your aches because the smell is overwhelming. No, the smell is fantastic. Right, and you can put it, you can sniff it, you can snort it, pop it, snort it. <laughs> you, I mean, literally, but I guarantee you. Yeah, you're, you, you're guaranteeing me a lot. I am guaranteeing you because all my I, money back. I have rheumatoid. Uh, yeah, I have rheumatism in my neck. Yeah, and it's the only thing that works. Right. Okay. Excellent work there, Jane. Thanks for that. 
Uh, you know what you want to do with the uh, rheumatism? G get some pepper. I I've heard that tiger balm is good. Jersey. Moira. Hello. Moira. Oh, I was dozing off. You what? I said I was dozing off then. Well, you haven't been waiting that long, dear. It's only 20 minutes. I know. It's your lovely voice. It sends me off to wherever. No, I wanted to tell you, we can't call ourselves Conservatives anymore. I mean, there is no Conservative Party. Oh. So I put my thinking cap on and I came up with a lovely new name for the new party. The Purgatory Party. Purgatory Party. Oh, right. I see what you did there. Very Do you good. like it? Not really. Oh, I'm disappointed. <laughs> Well, we'll just add it to life's little disappointments, shall we? The Purgatory oh, we can't Party. can't stand anymore. No, we can't stand. We've, we've had it up to here and we can't take it anymore. No, we can't. No, no we can't. Right. And I'm sorry you're not well. Well? Hey, have you thought of getting one of those strap-on um, hot water bottles they oh, keep advertising? Phew. I had no idea where you were going there. <laughs> uh, oh, no, 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 like no, no, We're not no, 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 nothing yeah, like that. Nothing like that. No, a no, strap-on water bottle, have no. Have you heard they keep advertising them on your programme? Do they? Well, I'm and sure they're you excellent. You strap them on your front, your back, back and around your neck, especially bottom. when you're taking a dog for a walk. Right, I ain't got no dog, but um, I'll think about it. I'll give it uh, <laughs> great consideration. Thanks a lot, Moira. Keep thinking. Oldbury, Ranges. Hi, Nick. I want to talk about Rishi Sunak. Two points, yeah? One is, have you noticed when he talks, he starts bobbing his head up and down yes. like if he wants to be a bit taller? Well, he... <laughs> he's like... <laughs> you know, hang on a minute. He's like those what? dogs that people used to put in the back of their... in the back shelf of their car, and, and the head yeah. seemed to be unconnected with the rest of the body. He's like on <laughs> springs somehow. You know, yeah, he bounces yeah. his head around like that, you know, like he's, yeah. do like he's dodging balls. <laughs> yeah, and talking about dogs, right? What's happened to the corgis of the Queen? He always wishes Sunak. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's wishing Sunak going to come riding on one of those corgis, right, as a cavalry. That, that is a very good idea. Yeah, that would. <laughs> <laughs> he'd need a ladder to get up there. Yeah. What happened to the corgis? I think the corgis were um, given to um, Prince Andrew. Oh no. Yeah. So they've probably been marked up and sold on to some dodgy oligarch from Azerbaijan. <laughs> Or hot dogs or something like that. <laughs> he's, probably running, he's probably running a store right, in, in Hammersmith, right, yeah. selling hot dogs, That's right. That's right. Well, you've got to he's make ends to, meet somehow. Yeah, that, he's going to pay that £12 million, isn't he? So, I um, mean, <laughs> obviously his mum now, right, can't pay. You know, you can't sue somebody that's died up there for money, can you? So, uh, well, you know, if, that not, debt yeah. hasn't, if that debt hasn't been paid, mm. then it's uh, kind of outstanding, isn't yeah, it? Maybe. But not... Well, you need to find out what's actually happened to the court. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, sure. Leave it with me. That's what I'll do. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll go and find out straight away. Hey, there's, some, there's somebody on the. Hang well, on a minute, hey Ranjit. There's go somebody on the line who go. wants to um, have a have a beef with you. Hang on, I'll go on yeah, then. just one moment. Um, hello, Jean. Hello, Nick. Yes, I've got Ranjit on the line. What would you like to say? Yeah, you tell tell Ranjit. Don't believe his hard luck story about his prices mm -hmm. because he's overcharging. Right. And what makes you say that? I live in a very salubrious area of northwest London. Brent? And yet yeah, life <laughs> is no, no, no. It's yeah. a very expensive area oh, now. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and my local chippy who is very high class and yeah. does very good food. Sure. He is eight pounds for a very nice piece of cod and two pounds fifty for chips. What do you say to that, Okay, uh, Work that out. Eight pounds for a piece of cod, two yeah. pounds fifty. That's ten pounds fifty. Yes. Do your maths right, Jean, because I said ten pounds thirty. <laughs> <laughs> so that's 20 pence cheaper. And also, Jean, I'm, I'm not going to get angry, right? Also, it depends on what size the cod is. Yeah. Said, oh, it depends how big the portion of chips is, Jean. Correct, I'm glad I'm yeah. getting to you people. You know what? I love it. I mm -hmm. love you people, right? right? Because, right? You can't yeah. even get your maths right, Jean. Mm. Yeah, he, he has got a point there, Gene. <laughs> you couldn't add up to good eight pound and ten pound fifty. Even I can do that. Last time, last time 
he was saying that he charged ten pounds for a piece of cod, and he said no, 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 no I don't think so. Listen, yeah. love, love, love. Oh. Calm down, dear. Calm down. Calm yeah. down. Mm. Calm, calm down. down. Yeah. Calm down. Right. <laughs> Listen to what I say. Indulge it, and then reply. Please, I love you, Gene. Yeah, he loves you, Gene. Loves you very, very much. Okay, thanks, thanks very much to both of you. Get a room. O three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. I don't even need to be here. These listeners can just pick fights with each other all night long. <laughs> Two falls and a submission. My money's on Ranjit. I mean, I haven't seen either of them, but uh, you know, I, that's just a guess on my part. All right, thanks very much to both of you. Now, please go away. Southampton. Hello, John. Hello. Hello, John. Hi, uh, yeah. So, my my position is, is that because of the situation with, with nursing, is you can't really have strike action affecting <laughs> NHS services. I would go as far as to say as there's no employment rights at all, as that... Well, Typically, people have. <laughs> okay. <laughs> at least he was amused. No one else, just him. Chaotic scenes at the Scottish Tory conference after Number 10 tried to bar large sections of the media from a Q&A with Slippery Fishy. The Prime Minister had been due to hold an on-the-record huddle with press reporters after his... Don't... <laughs> I wouldn't huddle too close. You might break him. He'd been due to hold an on-the-record huddle with press reporters after his speech to, to uh, delegates at Glasgow's SEC this week. However, shortly before the event, it emerged that only six hand-picked titles would be allowed to put questions to the Prime Miniature. All other outlets were denied entry to the room. Guess which titles they were allowed in? The Guardian? No. Mirror? Of course not. Only the most right-wing friendly titles were allowed in the room. Because not answering difficult questions is Fish's number one priority. It's the country's number one priority. The preferred newspapers were The Daily Telegraph, The Daily Mail, The Daily Express, The Sun in Scotland, The Times and The Press and Journal. Oh, fabulous. I don't know what you're thinking. What's The Press and Journal when it's at home? Well, it's the publisher that also prints The Sunday Post, home of The Bruins and Ur Wally. They also print the Beano and the Dandy. I'm not making that up. Fishy Sunak is now only taking questions from the publishing house that puts out Lord Snooty of the Beano. My view. Exactly. And this dictator move to banish all but the friendliest of press caused a revolt. That's right. Journalists are revolting. <laughs> The assembled journalists who did not receive special friends of the regime status demanded that they at least be allowed to listen to the questions and the answers, even if they weren't allowed to pose one. And the Prime Minister's people said... No, 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 no! But you can't just push around the British press like that. And journalists who got shut out weren't going to take it lying down. So they ignored Fish's media handlers. And the reporters followed Number 10 staff through the corridors of the Glasgow's SEC Centre, where Fishy was to deliver his carefully prepared and focus-grouped comments. I swear, does that man ac actually say anything at all out loud that hasn't gone through a focus group before it gets to his mouth? So these journalists followed the Number 10 staff right to the door. And that's when the forces of darkness gave up. It's where one of Sunak henchpersons gave up the fight. They said, oh, OK, you know what, just let them all in, she said in exasperation. <laughs> and so the TV cameras and the journalists all swarmed into the room and there was a sort of a standoff between the media and Number 10 about who was to be allowed to ask questions of the dear leader. It's also, what would Donald Trump do? Except he'd do it while standing next to a helicopter with his rotors running so that no one could hear what he was being asked which allowed him to answer the questions that he wanted to get asked rather than the actual ones that reporters were asking. Donald Trump is not a very nice person. Donald Trump is a very nice person. And the broadcast reporters always uh, all, all wanted Sunak's reaction to the resignation of Tory donor Richard Sharp as the chairman of the BBC over his failure to declare a financial relationship with Mr Blobby. 
But Fishy hadn't had the answer focus grouped yet, so he didn't have a response, other than to say that he wasn't there to answer those questions, which makes you wonder if we have a democracy or a dictatorship. Journalists are supposed to ask the questions they want answers to, not the ones that politicians are willing to answer. I mean, ask Fishy how he keeps his hair so soft and his eyes so sparkly and he'll whitter on it for hours. Ask him where all the money went from fraud right under his watch and he'll clam up like, well, like a clam. And then there was the embarrassing scene of number 10 staff arguing with broadcasters, saying it was inappropriate for them to be filmed. Don't film the Prime Minister, he's a private person just going about his fishy business. And, after more than an hour of toing and froing and frayed tempers, Sunak finally did his question and answer with the original choice of questioners, but with other reporters allowed to watch. Quietly. From a distance. It is democracy in action. And when... And when Slippery was asked about his plan to talk to only a few hand-picked reporters, the Prime Minister said, that is absolutely not my understanding of what happened. What? Yeah. He wants you to disbelieve what you can see with your own eyes. He pulled that old Jedi mind trick. These are not the droids you're looking for. The problem is, of course, Fishy is not a Jedi. <laughs> Stretham. Hello, Paul. Oh, all right, Nick. Paul. Um, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. If you just could bear with me. That's all try right. And get, try and get myself across. Okay. Um, um, I think uh, I'm not scared of China. I'm not scared of Russia, right? I'm scared of America and Britain. They're out of control. It's the war on everything, right? Uh, America has 800 military bases all over the world, all over Africa, in the South China Sea, in Germany, in Britain, in Australia, they're everywhere, right? And then they have the audacity to say to China, you're spending too much on your military. But, Ch but America spent... America, America said that China is spending too much on its military. Yeah, because it increased its spending on its military last year, right? But America spent $800 billion dollars on its military. That's more than China, Russia... Yes, but what's, what's your um, idea that they're going to do with that influence, though? You think they're, what is it, a pension movement to take over the world? Sorry? You, you say that America has uh, military bases here, there and everywhere, uh, but what's your, uh, what, what's, what's the implication there, then? Why, why do you think they have those bases? Because America is a dying superpower, right? Is it? And... It, it's a warring nation. It was founded on genocide of the indigenous people, on slavery, right? Well, that, had this, that, well had we, we, had, we had quite a hand in that, but go on. It had this colonial attitude to this day, this John Wayne attitude, right? That we dominate the world. There cannot be any other superpower in the world. Not even a thousand miles away on the other side of the, of the world. Yeah, there's truth in that. Yeah, they, America will not um, be comfortable being overtaken, either economically or militarily, by another country, um, specifically in this instance, China. No, that will not make them happy. They will do probably right. everything they can to avoid that happening. That is right. And if it means destroying the planet in the process and still claim to be number one, they will do that. Well, I'm not, sure they, I'm not sure they would do that, but um, they, they might take extreme measures to, um, to maintain their position in the world, as, as anybody would to maintain their position if they're number one of any uh, tree that you might um, contemplate. But you're really more concerned about America and Britain than China. Listen, when was the last time China went to war with anybody? In the last 300 years, you tell me. Oh, well, I'm not histor an historian. Right, they went to war in Vietnam because they didn't want another American base on their borders. If you look at Vietnam, where it is, and South Korea, it's bolted on to China. So they don't want another base on their borders. They got one in Okinawa Island. It's right, a okay, so, so the answer to my question is yes, you are more concerned about America and Britain than um, China's. 100%. All right. Okay, all right. Thanks, Paul. Lewisham, hello, Jane. Hello, 
only. Hello, Jane. You do have the art of making us laugh, and we do need laughter yeah. sometimes. Right, just sometimes. Every now and again, let a little happiness into your life. Huh. Yeah. Definitely. But you were saying about people leaving school early, but carpenters and plumbers and electricians, mm. they all take apprentice and they leave at, what, 16, and they used to leave at 14 mm. and 15. Dean. Well, you could say and apprenticeship is. You could, of course, we do. Yeah, you could say apprenticeships uh, are education. But uh, university now is just a big con. Is it? It's just a mess. Yeah, most of the subjects are just hobby subjects. Well, that's and not true. And they don't realise that they're getting themselves into massive debt for a hobby subject that they could learn themselves. I, and I don't think that that's true. It is true. And <laughs> oh, well, you should have said. <laughs> listen, some subject don't what you threaten said, me. the government should pay for yeah shouldn't they medicine um primarily so but engineers come, that kind of yes thing. yes um and i do like the they are you know they have they are encouraging skills now they've realized that skills are important now, are they but, are they doing that are they encouraging skills i'm yeah. not sure that that's true in what manner are they encouraging skills uh, uh, Tony Blair's son has got this business, hasn't he? Well, what's that got to do with the government? Yes, I suppose, <laughs> well, just because he was Prime Minister and he gave his son the idea and to do And don't say this. that his son is uh, actually, I mean, the way you said that implies that his son is doing us a favour. He's become uh, richer than his dad by doing that. Yes, and that is a good... How did he come rich, so rich by doing that, Bob? Because it's the, the company that... I can't remember precisely what it is he does, but the, the value of the company that uh, provides the service has become um, fabulously uh, wealthy, but, um, but by that method, so has he. Yeah, I do know that. Um, but he is providing pres um, apprenticeships, isn't it? And that is very, very good. Right. But, yeah, and but, but yeah, again, you're implying that he's doing it uh, as, a, as a favour. It's, it's a business, making money. Isn't he? Well, that is good also. <laughs> well, it's good for him. And it's good for other people. That right, is yeah. good business. Right. OK, well, we can agree on that, perhaps, yeah. And Apprenticeships let's get are back good. To, let's get back to Brexit. Oh, France no. France is in a terrible, terrible state. It's doing better than we are. And, no, it, it isn't. Absolu and it, it absolutely is, Jane. By what measure is France <laughs> doing worse than us? Well, it, well if you You don't know. You're just making France, it up. It's slummy in a lot of places. Well, it's slummy where the slums are, Brexit. if that's what you mean. They should Brexit. Yeah, the thing with Brexit is that any country that has even toyed with the idea of leaving the European Union has seen the idiocy of doing that. We have demonstrated it to them, and we continue to do so in every way, in every day. Then they have put that right out their minds. Brexit is the gift that keeps on giving for other countries. Get your head out your armpit there, Jane. <laughs> that ain't true. In fact, nothing that you just said is true, but do you, um, you're one of those people that uh, insists that you're right based on absolutely no information of any kind whatsoever, and there's no point in arguing with you because you will not be told. But anyway, appreciate the call. Thanks, Jane. Crystal Palace, hello, Jay. Right. I've got a word to the old to the old I spent... I'm preparing for the new building rights, which are coming on 15th of June. There's going to be a whole raft of changes where every insulation will have to be photographed. There's a whole, it is called the Golden Triangle. So, 
what I'm saying is I wouldn't sit down there because I'm, some, I'm doing something about this. I'm a child today and I get involved very heavily on hit losses and hit gains and buildings. Now, for the first time, building control is going to bring in part of, which is excessive hit from the buildings. How do you handle that? So there's a lot being done in the background. There's numpties are sitting there, raising around. Like people like us, we have to learn the new software like thermal uh, dynamics. Right. Okay, software. so what you're saying is that the, the government is actually doing something by um, bringing in regulations um, concerning uh, uh, heat loss from buildings. Okay, um, got it. Thanks, Jay. Chelmsford. Hello, Tom. Hello, Nick. Um, yeah, I'll just, um, I was listening to your previous caller. I'll just say, if any one of us were subjected to that kind of public scrutiny, mm. then I'm sure we would all fall short. Um, the kind of scrutiny yeah. that, that who has yeah. been subjected to? Who, who do you have in uh, mind? Well, the king. Oh, okay. And, and uh, well, that's what we're talking about. But do you, and, do you um, actually think that he has been subject to public scrutiny? Because, I mean, well, what, what do we actually know about him? Well, just he I, likes well, he I'm, likes plants. Talk, he, mm, no, I'm, I'm sure he likes uh, a lot of things. Yeah, no we, doubt. Don't we all? But um, I mean, the things we know about him. Well, the things we've heard about him are that he's particularly uh, a picky person who um, mm. uh, is uh, not entirely nice to his staff, and he demands all sorts of things. Like uh, you hear that his chefs when he was out hunting had to make mm. a, a boiled egg every single minute because on his mm. arrival back at the palace he would demand a three minute or four minute whatever it was boiled egg and if one was not presented then uh, p people were uh, going to be for the high jump and so they had to boil an egg every minute just to be sure that they had one that was three yeah, minutes okay. when he when he yeah. walked through the door he's but uh, constitutionally he's the head of state so i mean what I called about and what my main uh, point of this, uh, what I wanted to say was um, I'm, if, if the monarchy, which, uh, I mean, that, that ceremony that they're going to do, uh, apparently, I, I'm led to believe, uh, originates in Bath Abbey in like about sort of 800 ID. Yeah, it's about a thousand years old, apparently. Yeah, uh, more than that. And then, uh, you know, and... Um, if that's going to all come to an end, I mean, what, what, what I mean... Right, so that is a good point. I, I just, it, it is a... I'm just, just, just to finish that thought, if you don't mind, Tom, I, that is a good point. Well, that, no, but as a state, what, what are we, we, we need a, a head of state. So, well, mean, we don't need one. Uh, well, I mean, other countries get by without well, one. No, every single country diplomatically needs a, a head of state. Well, I mean, some, some countries, the leader who, yeah. of the president or the prime minister or whatever is the head of state, so we don't actually need another person. I mean, you know, big countries have got so along quite well with that one. So your proposal is that yeah. uh, the prime minister, Rishi Sunak, is the head of state. My proposal would be nothing of the sort, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely not. That's a no from me. No. Well, um, I think okay. he's got plenty enough power as it is. You say... It's a... I mean, look... Your, your point, if, if you don't mind, if I fill in the gaps, is that we have a thousand years or more history uh, with all of the, uh, the ceremony that goes with it, the feathers and the buckled shoes and all that uh, silliness, and people quite like that. You know, there's not many places on earth that you can get all of that. And so to just throw it away for the sake of saving 100 million or 200 million or whatever it might be, um, you, I mean, although it seems, seems ridiculous to say it, it's not worth it. As we're sort of stuck with where we are with the monarchy, we might as well put on a big show, I guess, is, uh, it would be a justified point. And um, that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, Wembley. Hello, Mike. Hi. Hello. Yes, Mike. Yeah, I'm on. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, we've got a good signal. I'll pop outside the door. You got me? Yes. I was going to just talk about Rishi, and he's been the most impressive one. I mean, obviously, he has difficulties, but... I'm so impressed that, that he hasn't come in 
are winding up the the, the, the world war, war situation that we're now in hey? with China and Russia. He, he hasn't said a word about that. He's, he's been like a Henry Kissinger. You know, and that, and that that's important. He hasn't said a word about what? About, well, about... He hasn't gone in abusing the Russians. He hasn't gone in abusing the Chinese. You know, he, he's been careful with it. It's been said behind closed doors, but he hasn't come out publicly and uh, and been abusive to them. Because well, I, what do you mean I abusive? Think... We're, we're providing Ukraine with weapons and technology and, um, by some accounts, actual real-life soldiers. But yeah, well, yes, by some accounts, but he hasn't sort of said, we're going to fight to the last Ukrainian, as, as the Americans are saying. I, I think he's been, I, I think he's been very, very wise to, to, uh, to, 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 to moderate his speech on it, because I think immoderate speech in a, in a difficult situation, it, it, it makes it worse at all times. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, you, you could say that that's just uh, weakness. That's one of the reasons why Vladimir Putin <laughs> felt emboldened to go into Ukraine in the first place. I, I wouldn't say that. I, I mean, I, I take your point on that, but I, I, my, my feeling is 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 one's two two thinking men like Khrushchev and Kennedy, two thinking men. They sorted a problem out in. in in probably half an hour. That that's all they need. They need thinking men, and I, I, I like the way Rishi's come across as a thinking man. He, he's not going <laughs> in. It's a thinking man. Thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Mike. A thinking man. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. I don't think he thinks uh, too well. I mean, just look at the people he surrounds himself with. I mean, it's just a cat. It's it's a catalogue of failures. It's just extraordinary how bad his choice of uh, people is. Ambrosine in Finchley. Hello. Hello. Hi, Nick. Um, you know, um, this is not the first, should I say, faux pas that Diane Habert uh, had against uh, or spoken about the Jewish people. Uh, um, around 2019 to 2020, Hackney, the area that her constituency had the second most reports of anti-Semitic hate crime in the whole of the London area. In 2021 to 22, we're now in 23, but in last year, had the highest rate of anti-Semitic tax in her constituency. Um, her calling Jewish uh, religious attire as costumes um, her standing side by side and demonstrating constantly, constantly with different protests against people of an anti, well, who have been anti-Semitic. We're talking about protests in London against Israel. We're talking about protests. Well, there's, there's, there's a difference people. between being anti the Israeli government and being anti Jewish well, people. That's not the same and, thing at all. I mean, there's a lot of there's support, a lot of people support, in Israel support, who are against the Israeli government. Nick, she supports the BDS movement, which well, well, is I, a boycott I, I movement against Jewish businesses. Well, I don't know. So what that, that I, I, I don't. I don't know about that. But but saying that to you are against some of the policies of the Israeli government is not the same as being anti-Semitic. Yes. First call in Erith, Steve. Oh, hello, Nick. Steve. Um, do you remember yesterday I mentioned the telly? I don't, but I do remember talking about the television. It was you, was well, it? Anyway, you say no one's going crazy. I, every telly I've ever owned, I've, I have, have, well, smashed them, basically. But this one's going out the window, rock and roll style. Right, what floor do you live on? I'm in a bungalow. Oh, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, um, uh, I, uh, yeah um, uh, I, that even, I said to you about uh, a radio, uh, sorry, a channel that had 60s music. Yeah. Well, all they do is just repeat over and over again. Repeat, well, yeah, they're bound to, because yeah. there's, there's not many videos made of 1960s music. Mm, no, well, it doesn't matter about the videos. It's, uh, I, ju I just want to hear the music, but it's just... Yeah, but if it's a it. television channel, then uh, they are probably very, you know, the, the visual part is uh, very important. Uh, television, see? Yeah. Can, can, I, can I also mention something else that may be of use to you? Okay. Uh, a lady phoned up a, a week or two ago about tigers and tiger balm. Oh, yeah. Poor little tigers. 
Uh, no, but if if you don't know what tiger <laughs> balm is, it is really good stuff. Yeah, they have to wrestle a tiger to the ground and then they squeeze its essence no. out of it. Tiger balm. No, 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 no it, it, it contains like camphor and menthol and that, and and it does relieve minor aches in your joints and stuff. Yeah. It, if you rub it on your temples, it will relieve a headache. Right. It, it's that powerful that if you rub it on your temples without a headache, it will give you one. It will give you one, yeah. Okay, these are the jokes, folks. All right, thanks a lot, Steve. In this country, it is now such that the government can close down any protest by one or more people. If you make a noise. Or if you disturb any business in the vicinity. Or if any reasonable person, whatever the hell that means, would be uh, discombobulated by your presence. In other words, if they don't like what you're doing, they can throw you in jail. And there's, um, they just throw distractions at us again and again and again and again and again. And there's a giant one coming uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Big distraction, huge. And you know what it is. It's His Majesty's sparkly hat dance. And the papers are whipping themselves up into a frenzy to try and do that to us too. To make us interested in the continuing royal soap opera. These are headlines taken from, I think, two days on the Mail Online. These are two days worth of headlines in the Mail Online. All of these had huge stories with accompanying pictures below them. Princess Diana's jaw-dropping collection of jewellery, the fascinating stories behind her favourite pieces and the sparklers that have since been worn by Kate and Meghan Markle. The one question the Queen Mother banned people from asking. Is Kate Middleton's choice of practical yet stylish top-handled bags yet another sign that the Princess of Wales is now a queen in waiting? <laughs> you know, I hate headlines in newspapers that are questions. Is Kate's choice of practical yet stylish top handle bag yet another sign she is now queen in waiting i don't know you're the blooming newspaper you tell me asking us questions anyway that's three three headlines so far last couple of days post honeymoon post honeymoon glow lady uh, lady amelia spencer is reunited with her sister eliza in barcelona as she returns from her lavish honeymoon in the maldives i've got no idea who either of those people are Five fabulous years of Prince Louis. All the times the cheeky royals stole the spotlight and melted our hearts with his antics as Kate and William's youngest, youngest son celebrates his birthday this weekend. <laughs> oh my God, it's so infantile. He truly loves his wife. Prince William sends royal fans wild with gushing words about Kate on visit to Birmingham. And then... Royal fans go wild as Kate is spotted carrying her own 650 pound tote bag. Really? Did they go wild? Is that a fact? And how did that manifest itself? Were they pulling their hair out, running around the streets screaming, ripping their clothes off? In what manner did they go wild? Inside the Queen's Balmoral Castle study. Unseen photo of late monarch offers a rare glimpse of Her Majesty's treasures. Prince Archie's fourth birthday party will be a low-key celebration held at the Sussex Montecito home. Royal recycler Kate dressed Prince Louis in 58-pound hand-me-down shirt from big brother Prince George. Common speaker Lindsay Hall reveals the traditional coronation bed and issues an intriguing invitation to King Charles and Queen Camilla. <laughs> Well, my mind's spinning. My mother Camilla married Charles for love, Tom Parker Bowles says. Camilla's coronation companions revealed. King Charles is desperately trying to heal the royal rift with Harry and Meghan ahead of his coronation with Olive Branch's decision to include a photo of the Sussexes in the ceremony's official souvenir programme, experts say. A bridesmaid to the Queen is denied a coronation invitation. And Sarah Ferguson wasn't invited to the coronation because it would have provoked criticism which Charles doesn't need, experts say. Three days. Maybe two, three days at most of headlines. And that's 
uh, and that's not even including all of the ones about Hazard and Sparkles. I mean, they b barely even got a mention. I mean, they are ramping it up. They're, they're so desperate for us to keep uh, our interest up because, uh, you know, what else are they going to write about in a slow news day? 0345 I mean, they can see us losing interest because after the Queen, nobody really feels that bothered about Charlie. I mean, he's not the sort of person to be, to be sort of emotionally attached to, really, is he? I mean, when the Queen was alive, did you really uh, hang on his every word? Were you keen to hear his latest uh, thoughts about vegetables? <laughs> no. No. Of course not. And um, like I've said many times before, he doesn't uh, waft around in a pastel cloud of loveliness like the Queen did. He, do he does not light up a place when he walks into it like the Queen did. And so there's just no interest there. And that really terrifies the establishment, for one, because it's a, it's a perfect um, distraction from everything that ails us. You know, just th throw something um, sparkly in there and people will forget that they're starving to death. But it terrifies the press even more because what the hell are they going to write about? So here is the news about his uh, chasness. For the first time in history, millions across the country will be asked to make their promise to the king by saying the following out loud. You ready? This is according to the Super Soraway Sunday Times. This is what we're going to be asked to say next, um... I don't even know when it is. Wh when is it? Coronation? Yeah. Saturday. Saturday. Next Saturday, Saturday yeah. Right, yeah. What's happening on Sunday? I don't know. We're all off, aren't we? Monday? Off. <laughs> off. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, for the first time in history, millions across the country are going to be asked to make their promise to the king by saying the following out loud. I swear that I will pay true... Hang on, it requires music. I swear that I will pay true allegiance to your majesty and to your heirs and successors according to the law, so help me God. Yeah, well, let me think about that for a while. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I swear that I will pay true allegiance to your majesty and to your heirs and successors according to the law, so help me God. No. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Not a chance. I'll, I'll say that if you pay inheritance tax. How does that sound? And you believe that? Because of an invisible space wizard said so. Sure. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Camden. Hello, Ellie. Do, 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 do. Oh, that was for Rose. That right. was a bit of beta of the Ah, I, I recognised it straight away. You did not. I didn't, no. <laughs> anyway. Shall I send you a bit of after No, mother? please don't. That's <laughs> good because I don't remember it very well. I was calling to say I want to um, find out. You were saying that these, um, this whole palaver, or shall I say, sacred ceremony yes. of the coronation, mm -hmm. is all about uh, buckled shoes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as, as far as my memory of history goes, which is quite a long way actually, but may not be accurate. Those were worn by the Cromwellians, who actually went all out to destroy every royal in sight. So can your glamorous assistant, who sounds very nice, check that out? Uh, well, he would be able to, uh, but unfortunately he, there's only a minute or so to go before he puts his coat on and leaves the building. So okay, uh, you've well, left I it a bit think, late. I just think that as Prince Charles had such a terrible time at the inauguration of the Prince of Wales... Um, if you threw in a couple of uh, maybe 250 grand, uh, then maybe we should really support him on his day because at that time I felt dreadfully embarrassed for him. It was a horrible ceremony. He looked totally out of it. And <laughs> I think he gritted his teeth and bore it. Right. Okay. So I just wanted to say that because he just happens to be a human being, I think. Uh, yes, well, he, he, yes, quite right. He, he, As far as I'm aware, he is a human being. Yeah. Okay, thanks for the good news. Trying to connect you. Sorry to keep you waiting. Yes, I'm calling in um, St. Ives a bloke called Jay. Jay, sorry to keep you waiting. 
Uh, good evening. Good evening. Yes, uh, Joe. What I wanted to... Uh, uh, Grant... Uh, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. I'm just, like, falling asleep. So, <laughs> basically... You're in a car, uh, Jay. Are you driving? Yeah, yes, I'm and working. you're falling asleep in your, in your car yes. while you're driving. <laughs> listen okay, to that's you. Great. Listen to you. So, okay, sorry. all right. Thanks, Jay. I mean, he probably didn't mean it like that, but that's not a very good start, is it? I'm, I'm falling asleep listening to you, and um, I'd like a lot of time on your show to express my opinions. Yeah, sure. Yeah, here's all the time that you're going to get. Time's up. Lancaster. Rupert. Hello, Nick. Rupert. Are you an anti-Semite? Am I? No. Yeah. Is that it? Well, you, you, you're defending Diane Abbott for her anti-Semitic comments, so I'm asking you, are you an anti-Semite? Yeah, you, and I, I, I answered. Is this the same question again? This, the, you can answer. Well, you, you can, can, you you can, can answer uh, the question or not. I did. I did. <laughs> I did answer the question, Rupert. I answered it quickly and uh, robustly. In the uh, word of the moment, let's talk about this with Charlie Rowley. Charlie is political commentator and former special advisor to Michael Gove. Hello, Charlie. Hi, Nick. Hi. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks very much for being here. Um, you've probably seen this uh, Redfield and Wilton Strategies uh, poll, the latest Brexit tracker poll, finds that 61% of Britons say they would now vote to join the European Union. And if there was a referendum tomorrow, that same number say they would vote to uh, for the UK to join the EU. A mere 39% now say that they would uh, stay out of the EU. Why do you think people feel like that? Well, I think it's a, a combination of probably many things. So uh, I think in the report that you indicated, yes, it's clear that there are some uh, workers' rights issues where pubs are closing up and down the country. Over the bank holiday weekend and in the run-up to the combination, nobody wants to see uh, any hospitality venue uh, closed. Um, but I think there are issues when it comes to the hours that people can work. I think there's an issue about getting the people uh, from originally from uh, the EU that were able to travel to the UK to take up those jobs. I think that is one issue. I think COVID has obviously been a huge impact on all sectors, but particularly the hospitality sector. And of course, the cost of living, so the cost of uh, importing and producing the goods and making sure that actually pubs can... Uh, meet their demands of the costs that are required to keep their, their pubs open. It's been very, very difficult. So I think it's a combination of all of those things. Um, but, you know, it, it is the case that you do need to have people that are able uh, to continue to be able to work in the hospitality, hospitality sector. It was previously, it seemed easier when we were in the EU. It's become more difficult now. And that is a challenge, but it's the one that the, the government needs to, to, to address. Do you think that they're actually stuck in this ideology that anything that has uh, got the taint of Europe on it is just not wanted here, even if it does mean that we are essentially shooting ourselves in the foot? People's businesses are closing down because they just can't get the staff now that they can't access the pool of staff that we used to from the EU. You're right, in a sense. I think we need to make sure that if you're limiting, for example, I think students that are on student visas, people that are on student visas that come over to this country, I think there is a limit on maybe working, I think, 20 hours in, in, in hospitality. That could be extended to make sure that you can plug those gaps. So there are gaps that need plugs. There are issues that have arisen. And I think those issues need to be addressed, and they can be addressed. Um, without having to, to, to rejoin the EU. Um, I think it's important for full context uh, to, to let you know that I was on the Remain campaign myself. So, um, uh, you know, um, I didn't vote for Brexit, but I totally understood the reasons why people did. Um, but I think all of us now, I don't think opening the debate about rejoining is something that, that would be healthy for the country or, or healthy for, for the nation uh, to entertain. We've just got to make sure that where those problems arise, and clearly this is an issue where there is a shortfall of staff and where businesses are closing and livelihoods are uh, being put at risk, you know, the government needs to address that. Yes, well, it's interesting that you say that the, it's not really in the, the interests of the nation to revisit that argument, and, and yet almost two-thirds of the nation say that that's exactly what they want. So why do you think that politicians are refusing to actually address this issue, given that 61% of Britons are in agreement on this? Well, there's absolutely no doubt that the, in, in any polling that's conducted, that the number one issue that people care about in this country, and both Labour and the Conservatives, uh, and the Liberal Democrats, and every sort of it seems to me, 
uh, uh, sensible political party has been able to identify is the cost of living. You know, making sure that people in this country, uh, when they go to work, and uh, they, they're able to keep more of the money that they earn, uh, making sure that you know bills come down. There's obviously you know uh, inflation in this country not solely because of Ukraine, but that has been a, a huge impact on, on the cost of living. So the cost of living is the number one issue in this country that, that, that does need to be uh, addressed. I think uh, if people think rejoining the EU is somehow going to um, uh, you know, make the cost of living better for people, I think that would be a mistake because every European country is facing high inflation at the moment. So not, not, as, e- not as high as we are, though. I mean, uh, we, we are top of the tree in that regard. Switzerland's on 3%, Spain's on 4 Netherlands 4 Belgium 55 France 55 uh, Denmark's uh, or just 67 We're at 10 so well, I, every country I, I, has had COVID, every country has lived through this uh, Putin war. So what's the difference between us and them, apart from Brexit? Well, I think um, uh, the UK was a better performing economy than all of those countries. Um, uh, well, so it very much, course, de- it very much it, depends it, it, on, on what your start date is, as you know. I mean, that's uh, statistics. That's, that's, uh, that's the beauty of statistics. It can prove whatever you want. We, we haven't had the, the highest um, is, that's just a government refrain which is just you look at it too closely and this is absolute nonsense well i think the uk was a high performing one of the highest performing economies before uh, covid um and uh, and yes you're right to point out just before 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 brexit but i think that's why it will take us slightly longer and because of you know uh, uh, i think our uh, intervention in, in in the way in which we interfere during covid obviously there are huge um, uh, bills and debt that needs to be cut and that's one of the prime minister's uh, key, uh, uh, one of his key five priorities to cut debt, to grow the economy, to address essentially what I was talking about for the cost of living crisis, which is the number one issue on, on people's minds. It's really I odd, do. though, that, that mm. Rishi Sunak keeps saying that growth is his, uh, well, he has no end of number one priorities, but that's one of his number one priorities, that growth is, you know, uppermost in his mind. And the, 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 the very simple thing to do to increase growth dramatically above any other intervention that he could uh, engage in is to re- join the single market well I'm, I'm sure there'll be others as you say statistics can can play a role there'll be others um uh, perhaps more on the, the, the you know, studied brexit maybe closer than i have who would who would perhaps argue against that and and, and would point to things like the the european medical agency when it came to oh vaccine, please don't say that. that oh come um, on you, well, no, you I, charlie you you no, are it, way smarter than to believe that i can't believe you just said that the vaccine it, it, rollout it, you've got to be kidding me it's a view that I think. What I was just—it's not a view. It's it's a fa- it's a falsity. It's it's just not true. It, it, there's there's no um, right or wrong about that. That we could have had the vaccine rollout in the exact same way we did if we were part of the European Union, as you must know. Well, I, there will be others that are making that uh, point. I think it is a, a, a point that is out there that others will make. Um, yeah, strongly it's, a, it's a lie. But, is but, is but, what but, it is. But, but I think it is a fact that you know uh, when the uh, Oxford uh, vaccine came along, that uh, obviously the UK was able to roll it out a lot quicker, and uh, there was uh, which had absolutely uh, nothing to do with us being in the EU. You, you're continuing with that quite. falsehood. But but I think it took the European uh, European friends um, a lot longer to approve that vaccine, which obviously delayed a rollout when it came it, to, it's to, to a their completely ir- completely irrelevant. As you know, I'm I'm not going to get stuck into this argument with you because you must know you're way brighter than to be ignorant of the fact that the, the vaccine rollout had zero to do with us being in or out of the EU. Well, I think um, just one of the points I was making is that I think there are benefits of being outside of the EU, and I think you know you okay. can have let's, a, let's you hear have some. more control let's, of your let's money. Hear some. Well, well, you can have a, uh, <laughs> you can uh, make your own laws. You can uh, you can in, uh, you don't have to be uh, part of the EU budget, which is what a lot of people I think voted for Brexit. And as I say, look, you know, it was but a, being part of the EU budget, if if it cost us a pound, but we got a hundred back, is is that such a bad thing? Well, those are the debates that took place in 2016, and that's why I don't think it's healthy to revisit those. And well, I don't of think course it is. If, if we them. were dragged out, and if the future of this country was hampered forever because of a tissue of lies, then of course it must be revisited. We can't just um, say, oh, well, never mind, let's just uh, carry on down the wrong road because we, we made a decision based on uh, ignorance at, at some previous point. I'm looking at some, some uh, quotes from some of the chief proponents of Brexit here. Rhys Mogg, the price of food will go down, he said. Daniel Hannan, we can show with quantifiable empirical data how food bills and fuel bills and taxes will all be lower. 
Douglas Carswell, our food bills will be lower, our energy costs will be lower, our tax bills will be lower. All that sounds great, but all of it's completely wrong. Well, I, I genuinely believe um, that those people made that argument in good faith. I actually also genuinely believe, as again, someone that voted for Remain, um, uh, I genuinely believe that we will perhaps never really know the impact of Brexit because of COVID that came in uh, so quickly after that. And we do, because everybody had COVID. Well, you can take COVID out of the equation. Every, everyone suffered through the uh, the Putin war as well. So so that's an, irre an irrelevance. The difference, well, is, the difference between us and our European and um, first world competitors is Brexit. There's, there is no other difference. Unless it's, unless it's the Conservative government itself. It's the Conservative government's ineptitude. Maybe that's a factor. Well, I, I, I just, you know, politely point out, I don't think any other major political party, whether you're basically the Labour Party uh, at the next general election, if you've already decided that, or the Liberal Democrats, I don't think no major political party in the UK is advocating rejoining the EU. Don't you think that that's odd? I mean, that, that is an odd thing. That's an odd place. I mean, I think the Liberal Democrats have a different view than Labour and the Tories, but the two major parties, they both seem so frightened of the issue. Why do you think that is? Well, I think because, uh, just going back to, to the start, I think people really do, obviously, and everybody is, is worried, and rightly so, about the cost of living crisis and increase you know, the inflation that is stubbornly high. Mm. That needs to be but it's, but it's, addressed. But it's not being helped by us uh, having hampered our ability to trade with our biggest trading partner. I mean, that's, uh, that's a major factor in the cost of living increase, which is uh, worse in this country than uh, any of our major competitors. But the, the, the counter that, the, you know, others would say that, um, you know, if you uh, have control over your trade policy and you can make international trade agreements, that over time, uh, yes, you know, people will play around with statistics, but over time, uh, uh, trade will increase, bills will come down, uh, the economy will grow, and that ultimately has an impact on people's hand that, in their pocket, which all, is what All that want. sounds great, too, and it also sounds like you just, you just made it up. Just, just finally, Charlie. A figure that jumped out at me uh, this week was um, the number of businesses in the hospitality sector that are folding. And they are in, they are in want of about 140,000 people that they just can't get the jobs. They've advertised and, as was predicted before we left, British people just don't want to do these jobs. British people are either unwilling or they're doing better jobs. So the businesses are shutting down for want of 140,000 people, which is almost the exact same number as those who have been, um, who are now suffering, waiting for their asylum claims to be processed. Wouldn't it be better? I mean, we've got this pool, this resource pool, just sitting there, twiddling their thumbs, doing nothing. They want to work. They're highly motivated. Can't we just get them into work and benefit both them and us? Well, I think everybody in this country wants to make sure that there is a fair asylum system. So I think... Do you think um, that that's uh, what we've got? Uh, well, I don't think it's uh, uh, fair uh, or right that... Um, uh, I, I can't remember. It's it, 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 it 600 million a day. I think it's being spent on... Exactly. So I solve that problem by putting those people to work. But I don't think um, if you're... what. You, you, when you want to be fair to people who do genuinely want to come here to work, uh, by uh, having um, uh, an asylum system that allows people to come to the country ultimately illegally, to then just be presented with a job at the end mm. of it. Well, the problem with that illegally immigration. part is, as we know very well, that there is no legal way for most people to get here anymore, and that's the cute government to work around, is uh, they, they've stopped all legal routes, and, uh, and then um, it says, well... Uh, you, you can't, we'll, we'll chuck you on a plane to Rwanda if you come here illegally, but there's no other way of getting here. Well, you're, you're, you're absolutely right in a sense that um, I think part of the immigration bill that's going through Parliament needs to address more safe legal routes for people who genuinely obviously do have a claim and are seeking uh, persecution that do need to come into this country for refuge and to seek a new life because of uh, the horrors that they're facing in their own country. There does need to be uh, an increase in, uh, in safe legal routes and I think that's what Tim Loughton mm. MP has been advocating for and I think that should come forward in the immigration bill. We'll have to wait and see whether that does take place. But that shouldn't be 
uh, uh, you know, that is the right thing to do on the one hand. But on the other, I think most people in this country ultimately did vote for Brexit as well to take control of their... Well, I, I think they keep... voted for Brexit because Maurice Mogg told them the food food prices would go down. Daniel Hannan said that um, fuel, fuel bills, taxes and food bills will go down. And Douglas Carswell said food bills and energy costs and tax bills will go down. So, you know, we, we, we voted on um, a, a tower of lies. But just on this asylum thing, just finally... When mm. Theresa May was in power, 90% of uh, those people lodging asylum claims were seen and dealt with within six months. 90%. Now it's 10% after uh, it was Theresa May, Amber Rudd, Sajid Javid and Priti Patel. I think under Bradman it's even worse. This looks like a plot. It, it looks like a plan, doesn't it? That's, that's a, a straight line from top left to bottom right. 90% were seen within six months under Theresa May. 10% now. It just looks like the government is cynically um, keeping these people uh, in the permanent limbo just so that they can say, as you have, well, it's costing us, these, these dreadful people are costing us £6 million a day. It's, it's just perpetuating the fight. Well, I, I, I wouldn't accept that necessarily. I mean, I think um, it, it, it potentially shows the uh, increase in the number of people that are um, making that crossing illegally, it shows a systematic well, failure it seems to me within the Home Office. Yes. Well, I'm happy to criticise the Home Office who haven't been able to... Uh, I mean, I would be asking the question why those processing and those applications haven't taken place and why that number has fallen um, uh, dramatically, as you say. That is a clearly an issue that the Home Office needs to address. And I think the Prime Minister, you know, as part of his package of trying to make sure that you know, we do have a fair asylum system, uh, that there is going to be an increase in the number of a border patrols to stop people uh, making that crossing in the first place, but also an increase in the number of people making the, the, the uh, processing those applications, I should say, in order to ultimately ensure that people that who are genuinely seeking need uh, to come to this country do get it and are welcome here and have every right to be here. Uh, versus those that are, 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 are perhaps uh, simply uh, crossing that channel as economic migrants that just want to sort of get into the country where they're not fleeing mm. the horrors and the terrors that others who we should be more yes, open to. Ironically, we priority I, to. ironically, we actually do need economic migrants. But we're, we're, we're short of uh, hundreds of thousands of them. But um, uh, well, the rest of that conversation perhaps for another day. Thanks so much for joining us, Charlie. Charlie Rowley, political commentator, former special advisor to Michael Gove. Right, one, one call... Which one shall it be? Your your selection. Oh. Lines one to ten. Go ahead. <laughs> right. Let's have a go with Angela. Which one's that? County Durham. Where is she? She got caught off. Oh oh oh. Okay. Um. Right. County Durham. Hello, Angela. Hello. I Angela. I can't believe he's. Uh, you know why he's picked me? Why? Because I was just slagging him off. Oh yeah. I I, I said that he was very disloyal for leaving you. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your disloyalty. Yeah, I told him, but I said that, honestly, I remember the days of Amanda. He's the best assistant, glamorous, that you've had. <laughs> so I, I'm just going to try and get the kid a pay rise. And not just because he's northern, mm. even from though he's from, like, Stockport, Manchester area. Yeah, but right. anyway... Um, there's something I've been wanting to say for ages. Like, thank God we survived that uh, alarm last week, by the way. Yes. I thought we were going into a new uh, World War Three. But anyway. Oh, we will be. <laughs> oh, no, we will be. Oh, definitely. But I'll still yeah. be listening to LBC. You'll be in me years when I'm dying, like. But anyway. Right. Um, with me orange settees. Can I just say, you know, Ran you know Ranjit, who li who's got the fish up? Mm-hmm. I... Love him, and I didn't. Oh, you're ever really, know. really spreading your love around there, uh, Angela. I mean, can you not pick one? Pick one. Which is it to be? Ranjit. Is Ranjit every time you lose? Well, I'm glad she was taking me off now. All right, there you go. All right.